Treasure Island Author, Robert Louis Stevenson Part 1 The Old Buccaneer 1. The Old Sea Dog at the Admiral Benbow Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey And the rest of these gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace 17, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in, and the brown old seaman with the saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday, as he came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow a tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulder of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred, with black, broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. In the high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of stick like a hand spike that he carried, and when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This when it was brought to him. He drank slowly, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, says he at length. And a pleasant city-aided grog shop. Much company, mate. My father told him no. Very little company. The more was the pity. Well, then, said he, this is the birth for me. Hear you, matey. He cried to the man who trundled the barrow, bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want and that head up there for to watch ships off. What you mock call me? You mock call me captain. Oh, I see what you're at there. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I've worked through that, says he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed bad as his clothes were and coarsely as he spoke. He had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast, but seemed like a mate or skipper accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal George, that he had inquired what inns there were along the coast. And hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose, and described as lonely, had chosen it from the others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor next the fire and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to. Only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn and we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring men had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the one of company of his own kind that made him ask this question, but at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman did put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol. He would look in at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlor, and he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least. There was no secret about the matter, 
for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver four penny on the first of every month if I would only keep my whether I open for a seafaring man with one leg and let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough when the first of the month came round and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it, bring me my four penny piece and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature who had never had but the one leg and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly fourpenny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head would carry. And then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked, old, wild sea songs, minding nobody but sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum, all the neighbors joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all round. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question. Or sometimes because none was put, and so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the until he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry tortugas and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea. And the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down and sent shivering to their beds, but I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life. And there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a true sea dog and a real old salt and such like names, and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us, for he kept on staying week after week, and at last month after month. So that all the money had been long exhausted, and still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more, if ever he mentioned it. The captain blew through his nose so loudly that you might say he roared, and stared my poor father out of the room. I have seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I am sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. 
All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress, but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which, before the end, was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbors, and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. He was only once crossed, and that was towards the end, when my poor father was far gone in a decline that took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlor to smoke a pipe until his horse should come down from the hamlet, for we had no stabling at the old Benbow. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast the neat, bright doctor, with his powder as white as snow and his bright, black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the coltish country folk, and above all, with that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting, far gone in rum, with his arms on the table. Suddenly he the captain, that is began to pipe up his eternal song, fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. At first I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room, and the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of the one-legged seafaring man. But by this time we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new. That night, to nobody but Dr. Livesey, and on him I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect, for he looked up for a moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener on a new cure for the rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music, and at last flapped his hand upon the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Livesey's. He went on as before speaking clear and kind and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous, low oath, silence, there, between decks. Were you addressing me, sir? says the doctor, and when the ruffian had told him, with another oath, that this was so, I have only one thing to say to you, sir replies the doctor, that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's clasp knife, and balancing it open on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before, over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise, upon my honor, you shall hang at the next assizes. Then followed a battle of looks between them. But the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since I now know there is such a fellow in my district, you may count I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only, I'm a magistrate. And if I catch a breath of complaint against you, 
If it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, I'll take effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Livesey's horse came to the door and he rode away, but the captain held his peace that evening and for many evenings to come. Two black dog appears and disappears. It was not very long after this that there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of the captain, though not, as you will see, of his affairs. It was a bitter cold winter with long, hard frosts and heavy gales, and it was plain from the first that my poor father was little likely to see the spring. He sank daily. And my mother and I had all the inn upon our hands and were kept busy enough without paying much regard to our unpleasant guest. It was one January morning, very early a pinching. Frosty morning the cove, all gray with hoarfrost, the ripple lapping softly on the stones, the sun still low and only touching the hilltops and shining far to seaward. The captain had risen earlier than usual and set out down the beach, his cutlass swinging under the broad skirts of the old blue coat, his brass telescope under his arm, his hat tilted back upon his head. I remember his breath hanging like smoke in his wake as he strode off, and the last sound I heard of him as he turned the big rock was a loud snort of indignation as though his mind was still running upon Dr. Livesey. Well, mother was upstairs with father, and I was laying the breakfast table against the captain's return when the parlor door opened and a man stepped in on whom I had never set my eyes before. He was a pale, tallowy creature, wanting two fingers of the left hand, and though he wore a cutlass, he did not look much like a fighter. I had always my eye open for seafaring men, with one leg or two, and I remember this one puzzled me. He was not sailorly, and yet he had a smack of the sea about him too. I asked him what was for his service, and he said he would take rum. But as I was going out of the room to fetch it, he sat down upon a table and motioned me to draw near. I paused where I was with my napkin in my hand. Come here, Sonny, says he. Come nearer here. I took a step nearer. Is this here table for my mate, Bill? He asked with a kind of leer. I told him I did not know his mate, Bill. And this was for a person who stayed in our house whom we called the captain. Well, said he, my mate, Bill, would be called the captain as like as not. He has a cut on one cheek, and a mighty pleasant way with him, particularly in drink, has my mate Bill. We'll put it, for argument like, that your captain has a cut on one cheek and we'll put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one. Uh, well, I told you. Now, is my mate Bill in this here house? I told him he was out walking. Which way, Sonny? Which way is he gone? And when I had pointed out the rock and told him how the captain was likely to return and how soon and answered a few other questions, ah, uh, said he, this'll be as good as drink to my mate Bill. The expression of his face as he said these words was not at all pleasant, and I had my own reasons for thinking that the stranger was mistaken, even supposing he meant what he said. But it was no affair of mine, I thought, and besides, it was difficult to know what to do. The stranger kept hanging about just inside the inn door, peering round the corner like a cat waiting for a mouse. Once I stepped out myself into the road, but he immediately called me back, and as I did not obey quick enough for his fancy, a most horrible change came over his tallowy face and he ordered me in with an oath that made me jump. As soon as I was back again, he returned to his former manner, half fawning, half sneering, patted me on the shoulder, 
told me I was a good boy and he had taken quite a fancy to me. I have a son of my own, said he, as like you as two blocks, and he's all the pride of my art. But the great thing for boys is discipline, sunny discipline. Now, if you had sailed along of Bill, you wouldn't have stood there to be spoke to twice not you. That was never Bill's way, nor the way of Sitch as sailed with him. And here, sure enough, is my mate Bill, with a spyglass under his arm. Bless his old art, to be sure. You and me'll just go back into the parlor, Sonny, and get behind the door, and we'll give Bill a little surprise bless his art, I say again. So saying, the stranger backed along with me into the parlor and put me behind him in the corner so that we were both hidden by the open door. I was very uneasy and alarmed, as you may fancy, and it rather added to my fears to observe that the stranger was certainly frightened himself. He cleared the hilt of his cutlass and loosened the blade in the sheath. And all the time we were waiting there, he kept swallowing as if he felt what we used to call a lump in the throat. At last in strode the captain, slammed the door behind him, without looking to the right or left, and marched straight across the room to where his breakfast awaited him. Bill, said the stranger in a voice that I thought he had tried to make bold and big. The captain spun round on his heel and fronted us. All the brown had gone out of his face, and even his nose was blue. He had the look of a man who sees a ghost, or the evil one, or something worse, if anything can be, and upon my word. I felt sorry to see him all in a moment turn so old and sick. Come, Bill, you know me. You know an old shipmate, Bill, surely, said the stranger. The captain made a sort of gasp. Black dog, said he. And who else? Returned the other, getting more at his ease. Black dog as ever was, come for to see his old shipmate Billy at the Admiral Benbow Inn. Ah, Bill, Bill, we have seen a sight of times. Us too since I lost them two talons, holding up his mutilated hand. Now, look here, said the captain. You've run me down. Here I am. Well, then, speak up. What is it? That's you, Bill, returned Black Dog. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, as I've took such a liking to, and we'll sit down if you please, and talk square, like old shipmates. When I returned with the rum, they were already seated on either side of the captain's breakfast table black dog next to the door, and sitting sideways so as to have one eye on his old shipmate and one, as I thought, on his retreat. He bade me go and leave the door wide open, none of your keyholes for me. Sunny, he said, and I left them together and retired into the bar for a long time. Though I certainly did my best to listen, I could hear nothing but a low gatling, but at last the voices began to grow higher, and I could pick up a word or two, mostly oaths, from the captain. No, 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 and an end of it, he cried once. And again, if it comes to swinging, swing all, say I. Then all of a sudden there was a tremendous explosion of oaths and other noises the chair and table went over in a lump. A clash of steel followed, and then a cry of pain. And the next instant I saw a black dog in full flight, and the captain hotly pursuing both with drawn cutlasses and the former streaming blood from the left shoulder. Just at the door, the captain aimed at the fugitive one last tremendous cut, which would certainly have split him to the chine had it not been intercepted by our big signboard of Admiral Benbow. 
You may see the notch on the lower side of the frame to this day. That blow was the last of the battle. Once out upon the road, Black Dog, in spite of his wound, showed a wonderful clean pair of heels and disappeared over the edge of the hill in half a minute. The captain, for his part, stood staring at the signboard like a bewildered man. Then he passed his hand over his eyes several times and at last turned back into the house. Jim, says he, rum, and as he spoke, he reeled a little and caught himself with one hand against the wall. Are you hurt? cried I, rum. He repeated, I must get away from here. Rum, rum. I ran to fetch it but I was quite unsteadied by all that had fallen out, and I broke one glass and fouled the tap, and while I was still getting in my own way, I heard a loud fall in the parlor and running in, beheld the captain lying full length upon the floor. At the same instant my mother, alarmed by the cries and fighting, came running downstairs to help me. Between us we raised his head. He was breathing very loud and hard, but his eyes were closed and his face a horrible color. Dear, deary me, cried my mother, what a disgrace upon the house. And your poor father sick. In the meantime, we had no idea what to do to help the captain, nor any other thought but that he had got his death hurt in the scuffle with the stranger. I got the rum, to be sure, and tried to put it down his throat, but his teeth were tightly shut and his jaws as strong as iron. It was a happy relief for us when the door opened and Dr. Livesey came in on his visit to my father. Oh, doctor, we cried. What shall we do? Where is he wounded? Wounded? A fiddlestick's end, said the doctor. No more wounded than you or I. The man has had a stroke, as I warned him. Now, Mrs. Hawkins, just you run upstairs to your husband and tell him, if possible, nothing about it. For my part, I must do my best to save this fellow's trebly worthless life. Jim, you get me a basin. When I got back with the basin, the doctor had already ripped up the captain's sleeve and exposed his great sinewy arm. It was tattooed in several places. Here's luck. A fair wind and Billy Bones' fancy were very neatly and clearly executed on the forearm, and up near the shoulder there was a sketch of a gallows and a man hanging from a dun. As I thought, with great spirit, prophetic, said the doctor, touching this picture with his finger. And now, Master Billy Bones, if that be your name, we'll have a look at the color of your blood. Jim, he said, are you afraid of blood? No, sir, said I. Well, then, said he, you hold the basin. And with that, he took his lancet and opened a vein. A great deal of blood was taken before the captain opened his eyes and looked mistily about him. First he recognized the doctor with an unmistakable frown, then his glance fell upon me, and he looked relieved. But suddenly his color changed, and he tried to raise himself, crying, Where's Black Dog? There is no Black Dog here, said the doctor except what you have on your own back. You have been drinking rum. You have had a stroke, precisely as I told you, and I have just, very much against my own will, dragged you head foremost out of the grave. Now, Mr. Bones, that's not my name, he interrupted. Much I care, return the doctor. It's the name of a buccaneer of my acquaintance and I call you by it for the sake of shortness, and what I have to say to you is this. One glass of rum won't kill you, but if you take one, you'll take another and another. And I stake my wig if you don't break off short. You'll die, do you understand that? 
die and go to your own place like the man in the Bible. Come, now, make an effort. I'll help you to your bed for once. Between us, with much trouble, we managed to hoist him upstairs and laid him on his bed, where his head fell back on the pillow as if he were almost fainting. Now, mind you, said the doctor, I clear my conscience the name of rum for you as death. And with that he went off to see my father, taking me with him by the arm. This is nothing, he said as soon as he had closed the door. I have drawn blood enough to keep him quiet a while. He should lie for a week where he is that is the best thing for him and you, but another stroke would settle him. Three the black spot about noon, I stopped at the captain's door with some cooling drinks and medicines. He was lying very much as we had left him, only a little higher. And he seemed both weak and excited. Jim, he said, you're the only one here that's worth anything, and you know I've been always good to you. Never a month, but I've given you a silver four penny for yourself. And now you see, mate, I'm pretty low and deserted by all, and Jim, you'll bring me one noggin of rum. Now, won't you, matey? The doctor, I began, but he broke in cursing the doctor in a feeble voice but heartily. Doctors is all swabs, he said, and that doctor there, why, what do he know about seafaring men? I've been in places hot as pitch, and mates dropping round with yellow jack, and the blessed land a heaving like the sea with earthquakes what to the doctor know of lands like that? And I lived on rum, I tell you. It's been meat and drink, and man and wife, to me, and if I'm not to have my rum now I'm a poor old hulk on a lee shore, my blood'll be on you, Jim, and that doctor swab. And he ran on again for a while with curses. Look, Jim, how my fingers fidges. He continued in the pleading tone. I can't keep M still, not I. I haven't had a drop this blessed day. That doctor's a fool, I tell you. If I don't have a dram o oh rum, Jim, I'll have the horrors. I seen some on M already. I seen old Flint in the corner there, behind you, as plain as print I seen him. And if I get the horrors, I'm a man that has lived rough and I'll raise Cain. Your doctor himself said one glass wouldn't hurt me. I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin, Jim. He was growing more and more excited, and this alarmed me for my father who was very low that day and needed quiet. Besides, I was reassured by the doctor's words, now quoted to me. And rather offended by the offer of a bribe, I want none of your money, said I, but what you owe my father. I'll get you one glass and no more. When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. I, I, said he, that's some better, sure enough. And now, matey, did that doctor say how long I was to lie here in this old berth? A week at least, said I. Thunder, he cried, a week. I can't do that. They'd have the black spot on me by then. The lubbers is going about to get the wind of me this blessed moment. Lubbers as couldn't keep what they got and want to nail what is another's. Is that seemingly behavior now I want to know? But I'm a saving soul. I never wasted good money of mine, nor lost it neither, and I'll trick em again. I'm not afraid on em. I'll shake out another reef, matey, and daddle em again. As he was thus speaking, he had risen from bed with great difficulty, holding to my shoulder with a grip that almost made me cry out, and moving his legs like so much dead weight. His words, spirited as they were in meaning, 
contrasted sadly with the weakness of the voice in which they were uttered. He paused when he had got into a sitting position on the edge. That doctor's done me, he murmured. My ears is singing. Lay me back. Before I could do much to help him, he had fallen back again to his former place, where he lay for a while silent. Jim, he said at length. You saw that seafaring man today? Black dog. I asked, ah. Black dog, says he. He's a bad un, but there's worse that put him on. Now, if I can't get away no how, and they tip me the black spot, mind you. It's my old sea chest they're after. You get on a horse you can, can't you? Well, then, you get on a horse and go to well. Yes, I will, to that eternal Dr. Suave. And tell him to pipe all hands magistrates and sitch and he'll lay em aboard at the Admiral Benbow all old Flint's crew, man and boy, all on em that's left. I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate, and I'm the awny one as knows the place. He gave it me at Savannah when he lay a dying, like as if I was to now, you see. But you won't peach unless they get the black spot on me. Or unless you see that black dog again, or a seafaring man with one leg, Jim him above all. But what is the black spot, Captain? I asked, that's a summons, mate. Or unless you see that black dog again, or a seafaring man with one leg, Jim him above all. But what is the black spot, Captain? I asked, that's a summons, mate. I'll tell you if they get that. But you keep your weather eye open, Jim, and I'll share with you equals upon my honor. He wandered a little longer, his voice growing weaker, but soon after I had given him his medicine, which he took like a child, with the remark, if ever a seaman wanted drugs, it's me. He fell at last into a heavy, swoon-like sleep in which I left him. What I should have done had all gone while well, I do not know. Probably I should have told the whole story to the doctor. For I was in mortal fear lest the captain should repent of his confessions and make an end of me. But as things fell out, my poor father died quite suddenly that evening, which put all other matters on one side. Our natural distress, the visits of the neighbors, the arranging of the funeral, and all the work of the inn to be carried on in the meanwhile kept me so busy that I had scarcely time to think of the captain, far less to be afraid of him. He got downstairs next morning. To be sure, and had his meals as usual, though he ate little and had more, I am afraid, than his usual supply of rum, for he helped himself out of the bar, scowling and blowing through his nose, and no one dared to cross him. On the night before the funeral he was as drunk as ever, and it was shocking, in that house of mourning, to hear him singing away at his ugly old sea song. But weak as he was, we were all in the fear of death for him, and the doctor was suddenly taken up with a case many miles away, and was never near the house after my father's death. I have said the captain was weak, and indeed he seemed rather to grow weaker than regain his strength. He clambered up and downstairs, and went from the parlor to the bar and back again and sometimes put his nose out of doors to smell the sea, holding on to the walls as he went for support and breathing hard and fast like a man on a steep mountain. He never particularly addressed me, and it is my belief he had as good as forgotten his confidences, but his temper was more flighty and allowing for his bodily weakness, more violent than ever. He had an alarming way now when he was drunk of drawing his cutlass and laying it bare before him on the table. But with all that, 
He minded people less and seemed shut up in his own thoughts and rather wandering. Once, for instance, to our extreme wonder, he piped up to a different air. A kind of country love song that he must have learned in his youth before he had begun to follow the sea. So things passed until the day after the funeral, and about three o'clock of a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I was standing at the door for a moment, full of sad thoughts about my father, when I saw someone drawing slowly near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick and wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched as if with age or weakness, and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I never saw in my life a more dreadful looking figure. He stopped a little from the inn, and raising his voice in an odd sing-song, addressed the air in front of him, will any kind friend inform a poor blind man? Who has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the gracious defense of his native country, England and God bless King George, where or in what part of this country he may now be? You are at the Admiral Benbow, Black Hill Cove, my good man, said I. I hear a voice, said he, a young voice. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me in? I held out my hand. And the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vice. I was so much startled that I struggled to withdraw. But the blind man pulled me close up to him with a single action of his arm. Now, boy, he said, take me into the captain. Sir, said I, upon my word I dare not. Oh, he sneered, that's it. Take me in straight, or I'll break your arm. And he gave it, as he spoke, a wrench that made me cry out. Sir, said I, it is for yourself I mean. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with a drawn cutlass. Another gentleman, come, now, march, interrupted he, and I never heard a voice so cruel and cold and ugly as that blind man's. It cowed me more than the pain, and I began to obey him at once, walking straight in at the door and towards the parlor, where our sick old buccaneer was sitting, dazed with rum. The blind man clung close to me, holding me in one iron fist and leaning almost more of his weight on me than I could carry, lead me straight up to him, and when I'm in view, cry out, here's a friend for you, Bill, if you don't. I'll do this, and with that he gave me a twitch that I thought would have made me faint. Between this and that, I was so utterly terrified of the blind beggar that I forgot my terror of the captain, and as I opened the parlor door, cried out the words he had ordered in a trembling voice. The poor captain raised his eyes, and at one look the rum went out of him and left him staring sober. The expression of his face was not so much of terror as of mortal sickness. He made a movement to rise, but I do not believe he had enough force left in his body. Now, Bill, sit where you are, said the beggar. If I can't see, I can hear a finger stirring. Business is business. Hold out your left hand. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. We both obeyed him to the letter. And I saw him pass something from the hollow of the hand that held his stick into the palm of the captain's, which closed upon it instantly. And now that's done, said the blind man. And at the words he suddenly left hold of me, and with incredible accuracy and nimbleness, skipped out of the parlor and into the road, where, as I still stood motionless, I could hear his stick go tap-tap-tapping into the distance. 
It was some time before either I or the captain seemed to gather our senses, but at length, and about at the same moment, I released his wrist, which I was still holding, and he drew in his hand and looked sharply into the palm. Ten o'clock, he cried. Six hours. We'll do them yet, and he sprang to his feet. Even as he did so, he reeled, put his hand to his throat, stood swaying for a moment, and then, with a peculiar sound, fell from his whole height face foremost to the floor. I ran to him at once, calling to my mother, but haste was all in vain. The captain had been struck dead by thundering apoplexy. It is a curious thing to understand, for I had certainly never liked the man. Though of late I had begun to pity him, but as soon as I saw that he was dead, I burst into a flood of tears. It was the second death I had known, and the sorrow of the first was still fresh in my heart. For the sea chest I lost no time, of course, in telling my mother all that I knew, and perhaps should have told her long before. And we saw ourselves at once in a difficult and dangerous position. Some of the man's money, if he had any, was certainly due to us, but it was not likely that our captain's shipmates, above all the two specimens seen by me, Black Dog and the Blind Beggar, would be inclined to give up their booty in payment of the dead man's debts. The captain's order to mount at once and ride for Dr. Livesey would have left my mother alone and unprotected, which was not to be thought of. Indeed, it seemed impossible for either of us to remain much longer in the house. The fall of coals in the kitchen grate, the very ticking of the clock, filled us with alarms. The neighborhood, to our ears, seemed haunted by approaching footsteps. And what between the dead body of the captain on the parlor floor and the thought of that detestable blind beggar hovering near at hand and ready to return, there were moments when, as the saying goes, I jumped in my skin for terror. Something must speedily be resolved upon, and it occurred to us at last to go forth together and seek help in the neighboring hamlet. No sooner said than done. Bareheaded as we were, we ran out at once in the gathering evening and the frosty fog. The hamlet lay not many hundred yards away, though out of view, on the other side of the next cove, and what greatly encouraged me. It was in an opposite direction from that whence the blind man had made his appearance and whither he had presumably returned. We were not many minutes on the road, though we sometimes stopped to lay hold of each other and hearken. But there was no unusual sound nothing but the low wash of the ripple and the croaking of the inmates of the wood. It was already candlelight when we reached the hamlet, and I shall never forget how much I was cheered to see the yellow shine in doors and windows, but that, as it proved, was the best of the help we were likely to get in that quarter. For you would have thought men would have been ashamed of themselves no soul would consent to return with us to the Admiral Benbow. The more we told of our troubles, the more man, woman, and child they clung to the shelter of their houses. The name of Captain Flint, though it was strange to me, was well enough known to some there and carried a great weight of terror. Some of the men who had been to field work on the far side of the Admiral Benbow remembered, besides, to have seen several strangers on the road and taking them to be smugglers, to have bolted away, and one at least had seen a little lugger in what we called Kit's Hole. For that matter, anyone who was a comrade of the captain's was enough to frighten them to death. And the short and the long of the matter was that while we could get several who were willing enough to ride to Dr. Livesey's, which lay in another direction, not one would help us to defend the inn. 
They say cowardice is infectious, but then argument is, on the other hand, a great emboldener, and so in each had said his say. My mother made them a speech. She would not, she declared, lose money that belonged to her fatherless boy, if none of the rest of you dare, she said, Jim and I dare. Back we will go the way we came. And small thanks to you big, hulking, chicken-hearted men. We'll have that chest open if we die for it. And I'll thank you for that bag, Mrs. Crossley, to bring back our lawful money in. Of course I said I would go with my mother, and of course they all cried out at our foolhardiness, but even then not a man would go along with us. All they would do was to give me a loaded pistol lest we were attacked, and to promise to have horses ready saddled in case we were pursued on our return, while one lad was to ride forward to the doctors in search of armed assistance. My heart was beating finely when we two set forth in the cold night upon this dangerous venture. A full moon was beginning to rise and peered redly through the upper edges of the fog, and this increased our haste, for it was plain, before we came forth again. That all would be as bright as day, and our departure exposed to the eyes of any watchers. We slipped along the hedges, noiseless and swift. Nor did we see or hear anything to increase our terrors, till, to our relief, the door of the Admiral Benbow had closed behind us. I slipped the bolt at once, and we stood and panted for a moment in the dark, alone in the house with the dead captain's body. Then my mother got a candle in the bar and holding each other's hands. We advanced into the parlor. He lay as we had left him, on his back, with his eyes open and one arm stretched out. Draw down the blind. Jim, whispered my mother. They might come and watch outside. And now, said she when I had done so, we have to get the key off that, and who's to touch it, I should like to know, and she gave a kind of sob as she said the words. I went down on my knees at once. On the floor close to his hand there was a little round of paper, blackened on the one side. I could not doubt that this was the black spot, and taking it up, I found written on the other side, in a very good, clear hand, this short message, you have till ten tonight. He had till ten, mother, said I, and just as I said it, our old clock began striking. This sudden noise startled us shockingly, but the news was good, for it was only six. Now, Jim, she said, that key. I felt in his pockets, one after another, a few small coins, a thimble, and some thread and big needles, a piece of pigtail tobacco bitten away at the end, his gully with the crooked handle, a pocket compass, and a tinder box were all that they contained. And I began to despair, perhaps it's round his neck, suggested my mother. Overcoming a strong repugnance, I tore open his shirt at the neck, and there, sure enough, Hanging to a bit of tarry string, which I cut with his own gully, we found the key. At this triumph we were filled with hope and hurried upstairs without delay to the little room where he had slept so long and where his box had stood since the day of his arrival. It was like any other seaman's chest on the outside, the initial, B burned on the top of it with a hot iron and the corners somewhat smashed and broken as by long, rough usage. Give me the key, said my mother, and though the lock was very stiff, she had turned it and thrown back the lid in a twinkling. A strong smell of tobacco and tar rose from the interior, but nothing was to be seen on the top except a suit of very good clothes, carefully brushed and folded. 
They had never been worn, my mother said. Under that, the miscellany began a quadrant. A tin canakin, several sticks of tobacco, two brace of very handsome pistols, a piece of bar silver, an old Spanish watch and some other trinkets of little value and mostly of foreign make, a pair of compasses mounted with brass, and five or six curious West Indian shells. I have often wondered since why he should have carried about these shells with him in his wandering, guilty, and hunted life. In the meantime, we had found nothing of any value but the silver and the trinkets, and neither of these were in our way. Underneath there was an old boat cloak, whitened with sea salt on many a harbor bar. My mother pulled it up with impatience, and there lay before us the last things in the chest, a bundle tied up in oilcloth and looking like papers and a canvas bag that gave forth. At a touch, the jingle of gold. I'll show these rogues that I'm an honest woman, said my mother. I'll have my dues and not a farthing over. Hold Mrs. Crossley's bag. And she began to count over the amount of the captain's score from the sailor's bag into the one that I was holding. It was a long, difficult business. For the coins were of all countries and sizes doubloons, and Louis Dior's, and guineas, and pieces of eight, and I know not what besides, all shaken together at random. The guineas, too, were about the scarcest, and it was with these only that my mother knew how to make her count. When we were about halfway through, I suddenly put my hand upon her arm, for I had heard in the silent, frosty air a sound that brought my heart into my mouth the tap-tapping of the blind man's stick upon the frozen road. It drew nearer and nearer, while we sat holding our breath. Then it struck sharp on the indoor, and then we could hear the handle being turned and the bolt rattling as the wretched being tried to enter. And then there was a long time of silence both within and without. At last the tapping recommenced, and, to our indescribable joy and gratitude, died slowly away again until it ceased to be heard. Mother, said I, take the hole and let's be going. For I was sure the bolted door must have seemed suspicious and would bring the whole hornet's nest about our ears, though how thankful I was that I had bolted it. None could tell who had never met that terrible blind man. But my mother, frightened as she was, would not consent to take a fraction more than was due to her and was obstinately unwilling to be content with less. It was not yet seven, she said, by a long way. She knew her rights and she would have them, and she was still arguing with me when a little low whistle sounded a good way off upon the hill. That was enough and more than enough. For both of us, I'll take what I have, she said, jumping to her feet, and I'll take this to square the count, said I, picking up the oilskin packet. Next moment we were both groping downstairs, leaving the candle by the empty chest, and the next we had opened the door and were in full retreat. We had not started a moment too soon. The fog was rapidly dispersing. Already the moon shone quite clear on the high ground on either side, and it was only in the exact bottom of the dell and round the tavern door that a thin veil still hung unbroken to conceal the first steps of our escape, far less than halfway to the hamlet. Very little beyond the bottom of the hill, we must come forth into the moonlight. Nor was this all, for the sound of several footsteps running came already to our ears. And as we looked back in their direction, a light tossing to and fro and still rapidly advancing showed that one of the newcomers carried a lantern. My dear, said my mother suddenly, take the money and run on. I am going to faint. 
This was certainly the end for both of us, I thought. How I cursed the cowardice of the neighbors. How I blamed my poor mother for her honesty and her greed, for her past foolhardiness and present weakness. We were just at the little bridge, by good fortune, and I helped her. Tottering as she was, to the edge of the bank, where, sure enough, she gave a sigh and fell on my shoulder. I do not know how I found the strength to do it at all, and I am afraid it was roughly done. But I managed to drag her down the bank, and a little way under the arch farther I could not move her, for the bridge was too low to let me do more than crawl below it. So there we had to stay my mother almost entirely exposed and both of us within earshot of the inn. Be the last of the blind man my curiosity, in a sense, was stronger than my fear. For I could not remain where I was, but crept back to the bank again, whence, sheltering my head behind a bush of broom, I might command the road before our door. I was scarcely in position ere my enemies began to arrive, seven or eight of them, running hard, their feet beating out of time along the road, and the man with the lantern some paces in front. Three men ran together, hand in hand, and I made out, even through the mist, that the middle man of this trio was the blind beggar. The next moment his voice showed me that I was right down with the door. He cried, I, I, sir, answered two or three. And a rush was made upon the Admiral Benbow, the lantern bearer following, and then I could see them pause and hear speeches passed in a lower key, as if they were surprised to find the door open. But the pause was brief, for the blind man again issued his commands. His voice sounded louder and higher, as if he were afire with eagerness and rage. In, 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 he shouted and cursed them for their delay. Four or five of them obeyed at once, two remaining on the road with the formidable beggar. There was a pause, then a cry of surprise, and then a voice shouting from the house, Bill's dead. But the blind man swore at them again for their delay. Search him, some of you shirking lovers, and the rest of you aloft and get the chest, he cried. I could hear their feet rattling up our old stairs so that the house must have shook with it. Promptly afterwards, fresh sounds of astonishment arose. The window of the captain's room was thrown open with a slam and a jingle of broken glass, and a man leaned out into the moonlight, head and shoulders, and addressed the blind beggar on the road below him. Pew, he cried, they've been before us. Someone's turned the chest out alow and aloft. Is it there? roared Pew. The money's there. The blind man cursed the money. Flint's fist, I mean, he cried. We don't see it here, no how, returned the man. Here, you below there, is it on Bill? cried the blind man again. At that another fellow, probably him who had remained below to search the captain's body, came to the door of the inn. Bill's been overhauled already, said he. Nothing left. It's these people of the inn, it's that boy. I wish I had put his eyes out, cried the blind man. Pew, there were no time ago they had the door bolted when I tried it. Scatter, lads, and find M. Sure enough, they left their glim here, said the fellow from the window. Scatter and find M. Rout the house out, reiterated Pew striking with his stick upon the road. Then there followed a great to-do through all our old inn. Heavy feet pounding to and fro, furniture thrown over, doors kicked in, until the very rocks re-echoed and the men came out again, one after another, on the road and declared that we were nowhere to be found. 
And just the same whistle that had alarmed my mother and myself over the dead captain's money was once more clearly audible through the night, but this time twice repeated. I had thought it to be the blind man's trumpet, so to speak, summoning his crew to the assault, but I now found that it was a signal from the hillside towards the hamlet, and from its effect upon the buccaneers, a signal to warn them of approaching danger. There's Dirk again, said one, twice. We'll have to budge, mates. Budge, you skulk, cried Pew. Dirk was a fool and a coward from the first you wouldn't mind him. They must be close by. They can't be far. You have your hands on it. Scatter and look for them, dogs. Oh, shiver my soul, he cried. If I had eyes. This appeal seemed to produce some effect, for two of the fellows began to look here and there among the lumber, but half-heartedly, I thought and with half an eye to their own danger all the time, while the rest stood irresolute on the road. You have your hands on thousands, you fools, and you hang a leg. You'd be as rich as kings if you could find it, and you know it's here, and you stand there skulking. There wasn't one of you dared face Bill, and I did it a blind man. And I'm to lose my chance for you. I'm to be a poor, crawling beggar, sponging for rum, when I might be rolling in a coach. If you had the pluck of a weevil and a biscuit, you would catch them still. Hang it, Pew. We've got the doubloons, grumbled one. They might have hid the blessed thing, said another. Take the George, Pew, and don't stand here squalling. Squalling was the word for it. Pew's anger rose so high at these objections till at last, his passion completely taking the upper hand. He struck at them right and left in his blindness and his stick sounded heavily on more than one. These, in their turn, cursed back at the blind miscreant, threatened him in horrid terms, and tried in vain to catch the stick and wrest it from his grasp. This quarrel was the saving of us for while it was still raging. Another sound came from the top of the hill on the side of the hamlet the tramp of horses galloping. Almost at the same time a pistol shot, flash, and report came from the hedge side. And that was plainly the last signal of danger, for the buccaneers turned at once and ran, separating in every direction, one seaward along the cove, one slant across the hill, and so on, so that in half a minute not a sign of them remained but Pew. Him they had deserted, whether in sheer panic or out of revenge for his ill words and blows I know not. But there he remained behind, tapping up and down the road in a frenzy and groping and calling for his comrades. Finally, he took a wrong turn and ran a few steps past me, towards the hamlet. Crying, Johnny, Black Dog, Dirk, and other names, you won't leave Old Pew. Mate's not Old Pew. Just then the noise of horses topped the rise, and four or five riders came in sight in the moonlight and swept at full gallop down the slope. At this Pew saw his error, turned with a scream, and ran straight for the ditch, into which he rolled. But he was on his feet again in a second and made another dash, now utterly bewildered, right under the nearest of the coming horses. The rider tried to save him, but in vain. Down went Pew with a cry that rang high into the night and the four hoofs trampled and spurned him and passed by. He fell on his side, then gently collapsed upon his face and moved no more. I leaped to my feet and hailed the riders. They were pulling up at any rate, horrified at the accident, and I soon saw what they were. One, tailing out behind the rest, 
was a lad that had gone from the hamlet to Dr. Livesey's. The rest were revenue officers whom he had met by the way, and with whom he had had the intelligence to return at once. Some news of the lugger in Kit's hole had found its way to Supervisor Dance and set him forth that night in our direction. And to that circumstance my mother and I owed our preservation from death. Pew is dead, stone dead. As for my mother, when we had carried her up to the hamlet, a little cold water and salts and that soon brought her back again and she was none the worse for her terror, though she still continued to deplore the balance of the money. In the meantime, the supervisor rode on, as fast as he could, to Kit's hole, but his men had to dismount and grope down the dingle, leading and sometimes supporting their horses, and in continual fear of ambushes, so it was no great matter for surprise that when they got down to the hole the lugger was already under way, though still close in. He hailed her. A voice replied, telling him to keep out of the moonlight or he would get some lead in him, and at the same time a bullet whistled close by his arm. Soon after, the lugger doubled the point and disappeared. Mr. Dance stood there, as he said, like a fish out of water, and all he could do was to dispatch a man to be, to warn the cutter, and that, said he, is just about as good as nothing. They've got off clean, and there's an end. Only, he added, I'm glad I trod on Master Pew's corns, for by this time he had heard my story. I went back with him to the Admiral Benbow, and you cannot imagine a house in such a state of smash. The very clock had been thrown down by these fellows in their furious hunt after my mother and myself. And though nothing had actually been taken away except the captain's money bag and a little silver from the till, I could see at once that we were ruined. Mister, Dance could make nothing of the scene. They got the money, you say? Well, then, Hawkins, what in fortune were they after? More money, I suppose. No, sir, not money, I think, replied I. In fact, sir, I believe I have the thing in my breast pocket, and to tell you the truth, I should like to get it put in safety. To be sure, boy, quite right, said he. I'll take it if you like. I thought perhaps, dear. Livesey, I began. Perfectly right, he interrupted very cheerily. Perfectly right, a gentleman and a magistrate. And now I come to think of it. I might as well ride round there myself and report to him or squire. Master Pew's dead, when all's done. Not that I regret it, but he's dead, you see and people will make it out against an officer of his majesty's revenue, if make it out they can. Now, I'll tell you, Hawkins, if you like, I'll take you along. I thanked him heartily for the offer, and we walked back to the hamlet where the horses were. By the time I had told mother of my purpose, they were all in the saddle. Dogger, said Mr. Dance, you have a good horse. Take up this lad behind you. As soon as I was mounted, holding on to Dogger's belt, the supervisor gave the word, and the party struck out at a bouncing trot on the road to Dr. Livesey's house. Six the captain's papers we rode hard all the way till we drew up before Dr. Livesey's door. The house was all dark to the front. Mr. Dance told me to jump down and knock and Dogger gave me a stirrup to descend by. The door was opened almost at once by the maid. Is Dr. Livesey in? I asked. No, she said. He had come home in the afternoon, but had gone up to the hall to dine and pass the evening with the squire. So there we go. Boys, said Mr. Dance. This time, as the distance was short, 
I did not mount, but ran with dogger stirrup leather to the lodge gates and up the long, leafless, moonlit avenue to where the white line of the hall buildings looked on either hand on great old gardens. Here Mr. Dance dismounted and taking me along with him, was admitted at a word into the house. The servant led us down a matted passage and showed us at the end into a great library, all lined with bookcases and busts upon the top of them, where the squire and Dr. Livesey sat, pipe in hand, on either side of a bright fire. I had never seen the squire so near at hand. He was a tall man, over six feet high and broad in proportion. And he had a bluff, rough and ruddy face, all roughened and reddened and lined in his long travels. His eyebrows were very black and moved readily, and this gave him a look of some temper. Not bad, you would say, but quick and high. Come in, Mr. Dance, says he, very stately and condescending. Good evening, Dance says the doctor with a nod, and good evening to you, friend Jim. What good wind brings you here? The supervisor stood up straight and stiff and told his story like a lesson. And you should have seen how the two gentlemen leaned forward and looked at each other and forgot to smoke in their surprise and interest. When they heard how my mother went back to the inn, Dr. Livesey fairly slapped his thigh, and the squire cried, Bravo, and broke his long pipe against the grate. Long before it was done, Mr. Trelawney, that, you will remember, was the squire's name, had got up from his seat and was striding about the room, and the doctor, as if to hear the better had taken off his powdered wig and sat there looking very strange indeed with his own close-cropped black pole. At last Mr. Dance finished the story. Mr. Dance, said the squire, you are a very noble fellow. And as for writing down that black, atrocious miscreant, I regard it as an act of virtue, sir, like stamping on a cockroach. This lad Hawkins is a trump, I perceive. Hawkins, will you ring that bell? Mr. Dance must have some ale. And so, Jim, said the doctor, you have the thing that they were after, have you? Here it is, sir, said I, and gave him the oilskin packet. The doctor looked it all over, as if his fingers were itching to open it, but instead of doing that, he put it quietly in the pocket of his coat. Squire, said he, when Dance has had his ale, he must, of course, be off on his majesty's service. But I mean to keep Jim Hawkins here to sleep at my house, and with your permission. I propose we should have up the cold pie and let him sup. As you will, Livesey, said the squire. Hawkins has earned better than cold pie. So a big pigeon pie was brought in and put on a side table, and I made a hearty supper, for I was as hungry as a hawk, while Mr. Dance was further complimented and at last dismissed. And now, Squire, said the doctor, and now, Livesey, said the squire in the same breath, one at a time, one at a time, laughed Dr. Livesey. You have heard of this flint, I suppose. Heard of him, cried the squire. Heard of him, you say. He was the bloodthirstiest buccaneer that sailed. Blackbeard was a child to flint. The Spaniards were so prodigiously afraid of him that. I tell you, sir, I was sometimes proud he was an Englishman. I've seen his topsails with these eyes off Trinidad and the cowardly son of a rum puncheon that I sailed with put back, put back, sir, into port of Spain. Well, I've heard of him myself in England, said the doctor, but the point is, had he money? Money, 
cried the squire. Have you heard the story? What were these villains after but money? What did they care for but money? For what would they risk their rascal carcasses but money? That we shall soon know, replied the doctor. But you are so confoundedly hot-headed and exclamatory that I cannot get a word in. What I want to know is this. Supposing that I have here in my pocket some clue to where Flint buried his treasure, will that treasure amount to much? Amount, sir, cried the squire. It will amount to this. If we have the clue you talk about, I fit out a ship in Bristol Dock and take you and Hawkins here along, and I'll have that treasure if I search a year. Very well, said the doctor. Now, then. If Jim is agreeable, we'll open the packet, and he laid it before him on the table. The bundle was sewn together, and the doctor had to get out his instrument case and cut the stitches with his medical scissors. It contained two things, a book and a sealed paper. First of all, we'll try the book, observed the doctor. The squire and I were both peering over his shoulder as he opened it, for Dr. Livesey had kindly motioned me to come round from the side table where I had been eating to enjoy the sport of the search. On the first page there were only some scraps of writing, such as a man with a pen in his hand might make for idleness or practice. One was the same as the tattoo mark, Billy Bones his fancy, then there was Mr. W, Bones, mate, no more rum, off palm key he got ITT, and some other snatches. Mostly single words and unintelligible. I could not help wondering who it was that had got ITT and what ITT was that he got. A knife in his back as like as not, not much instruction there, said Dr. Livesey as he passed on. The next ten or twelve pages were filled with a curious series of entries. There was a date at one end of the line and at the other a sum of money. As in common account books, but instead of explanatory writing, only a varying number of crosses between the two. On the 12th of June, 1745, for instance. A sum of 70 pounds had plainly become due to someone, and there was nothing but six crosses to explain the cause. In a few cases, to be sure, the name of a place would be added as off Caracas or a mere entry of latitude and longitude as 6207 foot 20, 1902 40. The record lasted over nearly 20 years, the amount of the separate entries growing larger as time went on. And at the end, a grand total had been made out after five or six wrong additions, and these words appended, Bones, his pile. I can't make head or tail of this, said Dr. Livesey. The thing is as clear as noonday, cried the squire. This is the black-hearted hound's account book. These crosses stand for the names of ships or towns that they sank or plundered. The sums are the scoundrel's share, and where he feared an ambiguity, you see he added something clearer. Off Caracas, now, you see, here was some unhappy vessel boarded off that coast. God help the poor souls that manned her quarrel long ago. Right, said the doctor, see what it is to be a traveler. Right, and the amounts increase, you see, as he rose in rank. There was little else in the volume, but a few bearings of places noted in the blank leaves towards the end, and a table for reducing French, English, and Spanish monies to a common value. Thrifty man, cried the doctor, he wasn't the one to be cheated. And now, said the squire, for the other. The paper had been sealed in several places with a thimble by way of seal. The very thimble, perhaps, that I had found in the captain's pocket. The doctor opened the seals with great care, 
and there fell out the map of an island with latitude and longitude, soundings, names of hills and bays and inlets, and every particular that would be needed to bring a ship to a safe anchorage upon its shores. It was about nine miles long and five across, shaped, you might say, like a fat dragon standing up, and had two fine landlocked harbors and a hill in the center part marked the spyglass. There were several editions of a later date, but above all, three crosses of red ink to on the north part of the island, one in the southwest and beside this last, in the same red ink and in a small, neat hand. Very different from the captain's tottery characters, these words, bulk of treasure here. Over on the back, the same hand had written this further information, tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the N of Enni, skeleton island EC and Bai, 10 feet. The bar silver is in the north cache. You can find it by the trend of the east hummock, 10 fathoms south of the black crag with the face on it. The arms are easy found in the sand hill N, point of north inlet cape, bearing E and a quarter N. J.F. That was all, but brief as it was. And to me incomprehensible, it filled the squire and Dr. Livesey with delight. Livesey, said the squire, you will give up this wretched practice at once. Tomorrow I start for Bristol. In three weeks time three weeks, two weeks ten days we'll have the best ship, sir, and the choicest crew in England. Hawkins shall come as cabin boy. You'll make a famous cabin boy, Hawkins. You. Livesey, our ship's doctor, I am Admiral. We'll take Rudruth, Joyce, and Hunter. We'll have favorable winds, a quick passage, and not the least difficulty in finding the spot and money to eat. To roll in, to play duck and drake with ever after. Trelawney, said the doctor, I'll go with you, and I'll go bail for it, so will Jim, and be a credit to the undertaking. There's only one man I'm afraid of. And who's that? cried the squire. Name the dog, sir. You, replied the doctor, for you cannot hold your tongue. We are not the only men who know of this paper. These fellows who attacked the into night bold, desperate blades, for sure, and the rest who stayed aboard that lugger, and more, I dare say, not far off, are one and all, through thick and thin, bound that they'll get that money. We must none of us go alone till we get to sea. Jim and I shall stick together in the meanwhile. You'll take Joyce and Hunter when you ride to Bristol, and from first to last, not one of us must breathe a word of what we've found. Livesey returned the squire. You are always in the right of it. I'll be as silent as the grave. Part two, the sea cook seven, I go to Bristol. It was longer than the squire imagined ere we were ready for the sea. And none of our first plans, not even Dr. Livesey's, of keeping me beside him could be carried out as we intended. The doctor had to go to London for a physician to take charge of his practice. The squire was hard at work at Bristol, and I lived on at the hall under the charge of old Rudruth, the gamekeeper, almost a prisoner. But full of sea dreams and the most charming anticipations of strange islands and adventures, I brooded by the hour together over the map, all the details of which I well remembered. Sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, I approached that island in my fancy from every possible direction. I explored every acre of its surface. I climbed a thousand times to that tall hill they call the spyglass, and from the top enjoyed the most wonderful and changing prospects. Sometimes the owl was thick with savages. 
with whom we fought, sometimes full of dangerous animals that hunted us, but in all my fancies nothing occurred to me so strange and tragic as our actual adventures. So the weeks passed on, till one fine day there came a letter addressed to Dr. Livesey, with this addition to be opened, in the case of his absence, by Tom Rudruth or young Hawkins. Obeying this order, we found, or rather I found for the gamekeeper, was a poor hand at reading anything but print the following important news. Old Anchor Inn, Bristol, March 1st, 17. Dear Livesey, I do not know whether you are at the hall or still in London. I send this in double to both places. The ship is bought and fitted. She lies at anchor, ready for sea. You never imagined a sweeter schooner a child might sail her 200 tons. Name, Hispaniola. I got her through my old friend, Blanley who has proved himself throughout the most surprising trump? Who has proved himself throughout the most surprising trump? The admirable fellow literally slaved in my interest, and so, I may say, did everyone in Bristol. As soon as they got wind of the port we sailed for treasure, I mean, Redruth, said I, interrupting the letter, Dr. Livesey will not like that. The squire has been talking, after all. Well, who's a better right? growled the gamekeeper. A pretty rum go if squire ain't to talk for Dr. Livesey, I should think. At that I gave up all attempts at commentary and read straight on. Blandly himself found the Hispaniola, and by the most admirable management got her for the merest trifle. There is a class of men in Bristol monstrously prejudiced against Blanley. They go the length of declaring that this honest creature would do anything for money, that the Hispaniola belonged to him, and that he sold at me absurdly high the most transparent calumnies. None of them dare, however, to deny the merits of the ship. So far there was not a hitch. The workpeople, to be sure rigors and what not were most annoyingly slow, but time cured that. It was the crew that troubled me. I wished a round score of men in case of natives, buccaneers. Or the odious French and I had the worry of the deuce itself to find so much as half a dozen, till the most remarkable stroke of fortune brought me the very man that I required. I was standing on the dock when, by the merest accident, I fell in talk with him. I found he was an old sailor, kept a public house, knew all the seafaring men in Bristol, had lost his health ashore, and wanted a good berth as cook to get to sea again. He had hobbled down there that morning, he said, to get a smell of the salt. I was monstrously touched so would you have been, Anne, out of pure pity, I engaged him on the spot to be ship's cook. Long John Silver, he is called, and has lost a leg. But that I regarded as a recommendation, since he lost it in his country's service, under the immortal hawk. He has no pension, Livesey. Imagine the abominable age we live in. Well, sir, I thought I had only found a cook, but it was a crew I had discovered. Between Silver and myself, we got together in a few days a company of the toughest old salts imaginable not pretty to look at, but fellows, by their faces, of the most indomitable spirit. I declare we could fight a frigate. Long John even got rid of two out of the six or seven I had already engaged. He showed me in a moment that they were just the sort of freshwater swabs we had to fear in an adventure of importance. I am in the most magnificent health and spirits, eating like a bull, sleeping like a tree, yet I shall not enjoy a moment till I hear my old tarpaulins tramping round the capstan. Seaward, ho! 
Hang the treasure. It's the glory of the sea that has turned my head. So now, Livesey, come post. Do not lose an hour, if you respect me. Let young Hawkins go at once to see his mother, with Rudruth for a guard, and then both come full speed to Bristol. John Trelawney Postscript I did not tell you that Blandley, who, by the way, is to send a consort after us if we don't turn up by the end of August, had found an admirable fellow for sailing master a stiff man, which I regret, but in all other respects a treasure. Long John Silver unearthed a very confident man for a mate, a man named Arrow. I have a boatswain who pipes, Livesey, so things shall go man o' war fashion on board the good ship Hispaniola. I forgot to tell you that Silver is a man of substance. I know of my own knowledge that he has a banker's account which has never been overdrawn. He leaves his wife to manage the inn, and as she is a woman of color. A pair of old bachelors like you and I may be excused for guessing that it is the wife, quite as much as the health, that sends him back to roving. J. T. Peep yes. Hawkins may stay one night with his mother. J. T. You can fancy the excitement into which that letter put me. I was half beside myself with glee, and if ever I despised a man. It was old Tom Redruth, who could do nothing but grumble and lament. Any of the under gamekeepers would gladly have changed places with him, but such was not the squire's pleasure. And the squire's pleasure was like law among them all. Nobody but old Redruth would have dared so much as even to grumble. The next morning he and I set out on foot for the Admiral Benbow. And there I found my mother in good health and spirits. The captain, who had so long been a cause of so much discomfort, was gone where the wicked cease from troubling. The squire had had everything repaired, and the public rooms and the sign repainted, and had added some furniture above all a beautiful armchair for mother in the bar. He had found her a boy as an apprentice also so that she should not want help while I was gone. It was on seeing that boy that I understood, for the first time, my situation. I had thought up to that moment of the adventures before me, not at all of the home that I was leaving, and now, at sight of this clumsy stranger, who was to stay here in my place beside my mother, I had my first attack of tears. I am afraid I led that boy a dog's life, for as he was new to the work, I had a hundred opportunities of setting him right and putting him down, and I was not slow to profit by them. The night passed, and the next day after dinner, Rodruth and I were afoot again and on the road. I said goodbye to mother and the cove where I had lived since I was born, and the dear old Admiral Benbow since he was repainted. No longer quite so dear. One of my last thoughts was of the captain, who had so often strode along the beach with his cocked hat, his saber-cut cheek, and his old brass telescope. Next moment we had turned the corner, and my home was out of sight. The mail picked us up about dusk at the Royal George on the Heath. I was wedged in between Ridruth and a stout old gentleman, and in spite of the swift motion and the cold night air, I must have dozed a great deal from the very first, and then slept like a log up hill and down dale through stage after stage, for when I was awakened at last it was by a punch in the ribs and I opened my eyes to find that we were standing still before a large building in a city street, and that the day had already broken a long time. Where are we? I asked. Bristol, said Tom. Get down. Mr. Trelawney had taken up his residence at an inn far down the docks to superintend the work upon the schooner. Thither we had now to walk, and our way, to my great delight, 
lay along the quays and beside the great multitude of ships of all sizes and rigs and nations. In one, sailors were singing at their work. In another, there were men aloft, high over my head, hanging to threads that seemed no thicker than a spider's. Though I had lived by the shore all my life, I seemed never to have been near the sea till then. The smell of tar and salt was something new. I saw the most wonderful figureheads that had all been far over the ocean. I saw, besides, many old sailors with rings in their ears, and whiskers curled in ringlets and tarry pigtails, and their swaggering, clumsy sea walk. And if I had seen as many kings or archbishops, I could not have been more delighted. And I was going to see myself, to see in a schooner, with a piping bosun and pigtailed singing seamen, to see, bound for an unknown island, and to seek for buried treasure. While I was still in this delightful dream, we came suddenly in front of a large inn and met Squire Trelawney, all dressed out like a sea officer, in stout blue cloth. Coming out of the door with a smile on his face and a capital imitation of a sailor's walk. Here you are, he cried, and the doctor came last night from London. Bravo! The ship's company complete. Oh, sir, cried I, when do we sail? Sail, says he, we sail tomorrow. Eight at the sign of the spyglass when I had done breakfasting the squire gave me a note addressed to John Silver at the sign of the spyglass, and told me I should easily find the place by following the line of the docks and keeping a bright lookout for a little tavern with a large brass telescope for sign. I set off. Overjoyed at this opportunity to see some more of the ships and seamen, and picked my way among a great crowd of people and carts and bales, for the dock was now at its busiest, until I found the tavern in question. It was a bright enough little place of entertainment. The sign was newly painted, the windows had neat red curtains, the floor was cleanly sanded. There was a street on each side and an open door on both which made the large, low room pretty clear to see in, in spite of clouds of tobacco smoke. The customers were mostly seafaring men, and they talked so loudly that I hung at the door, almost afraid to enter. As I was waiting, a man came out of a side room, and at a glance I was sure he must be Long John. His left leg was cut off close by the hip, and under the left shoulder he carried a crutch, which he managed with wonderful dexterity, hopping about upon it like a bird. He was very tall and strong, with a face as big as a ham plane and pale, but intelligent and smiling. Indeed, he seemed in the most cheerful spirits whistling as he moved about among the tables with a merry word or a slap on the shoulder for the more favored of his guests. Now, to tell you the truth, from the very first mention of Long John in Squire Trelawney's letter, I had taken a fear in my mind that he might prove to be the very one-legged sailor whom I had watched for so long at the old Benbow. But one look at the man before me was enough. I had seen the captain and black dog and the blind man, Pew, and I thought I knew what a buccaneer was like a very different creature. According to me, from this clean and pleasant-tempered landlord, I plucked up courage at once, crossed the threshold, and walked right up to the man where he stood, propped on his crutch. Talking to a customer, Mr. Silver, sir? I asked, holding out the note. Yes, my lad, said he, such is my name, to be sure. And who may you be? And then as he saw the squire's letter, he seemed to me to give something almost like a start. Oh, said he, quite loud, 
and offering his hand. I see. You are our new cabin boy. Pleased I am to see you. And he took my hand in his large, firm grasp. Just then one of the customers at the far side rose suddenly and made for the door. It was close by him, and he was out in the street in a moment. But his hurry had attracted my notice, and I recognized him at glance. It was the tallow-faced man, wanting two fingers, who had come first to the Admiral Benbow. Oh, I cried. Stop him. It's Black Dog. I don't care two coppers who he is, cried Silver, but he hasn't paid his score. Harry, run and catch him. One of the others who was nearest the door leaped up and started in pursuit. If he were Admiral Hawk, he shall pay his score, cried Silver. And then, relinquishing my hand, who did you say he was? He asked, black what? Dog, sir, said I, has Mr. Trelawney not told you of the buccaneers? He was one of them. So, cried Silver, in my house. Ben, run and help Harry. One of those swabs, was he? Was that you drinking with him, Morgan? Step up here. The man whom he called Morgan and Old, gray-haired, mahogany-faced sailor came forward pretty sheepishly, rolling his quid. Now, Morgan, said Long John very sternly. You never clapped your eyes on that black black dog before, did you now? Not I, sir, said Morgan with a salute. You didn't know his name, did you? No, sir. By the powers, Tom Morgan, it's as good for you, exclaimed the landlord. If you had been mixed up with the like of that, you would never have put another foot in my house. You may lay to that. And what was he saying to you? I don't rightly know. Sir, answered Morgan, do you call that a head on your shoulders or a blessed dead eye? Cried Long John, don't rightly know, don't you? Perhaps you don't happen to rightly know who he was speaking to, perhaps? Come, now, what was he jawing viags, cappiness, ships? Pipe up. What was it? We was a talkin' of keel hauling. Answered Morgan, keel hauling was you? And a mighty suitable thing, too, and you may lay to that. Get back to your place for a lover, Tom. And then, as Morgan rolled back to his seat, Silver added to me in a confidential whisper that was very flattering, as I thought, he's quite an honest man, Tom Morgan, Ani stupid. And now he ran on again, aloud, let's see Black Dog? No. I don't know the name, not I. Yet I kind of think I've, yes, I've seen the swab. He used to come here with a blind beggar, he used. That he did, you may be sure, said I. I knew that blind man too. His name was Pew. It was, cried Silver, now quite excited, Pew. That were his name for certain. Ah, uh, he looked a shark, he did. If we run down this black dog, now, there'll be news for Captain Trelawney. Ben's a good runner. Few seamen run better than Ben. He should run him down, hand over hand, by the powers. He talked oh, kill hauling, did he? I'll kill haul him. All the time he was jerking out these phrases, he was stumping up and down the tavern on his crutch, slapping tables with his hand, and giving such a show of excitement as would have convinced an old Bailey judge or a Bow Street runner. My suspicions had been thoroughly reawakened on finding Black Dog at the spyglass, and I watched the cook narrowly. But he was too deep and too ready and too clever for me. And by the time the two men had come back out of breath and confessed that they had lost the track in a crowd, and been scolded like thieves. I would have gone bail for the innocence of Long John Silver. See here, now, 
Hawkins, said he, here's a blessed hard thing on a man like me. Now, ain't it? There's Captain Trelawney wants he to think. Here I have this confounded son of a Dutchman sitting in my own house drinking of my own rum. Here you he comes and tells me of it plain. And here I let him give us all the slip before my blessed deadlights. Now, Hawkins, you do me justice with the captain. You're a lad, you are, but you're as smart as paint. I see that when you first come in. Now, here it is. What could I do with this old timber I hobble on? When I was an A.B. Master Mariner, I'd have come up alongside of him, hand over hand, and broached him to an embrace of old shakes. I would, but now, and then, all of a sudden, he stopped, and his jaw dropped as though he had remembered something. The score, he burst out. Three goes a oh, rum. Why? Shiver my timbers, if I hadn't forgotten my score. And falling on a bench, he laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks. I could not help joining. And we laughed together, peal after peal, until the tavern rang again. Why, what a precious old sea calf I am, he said at last, wiping his cheeks. You and me should get on well, Hawkins. For I'll take my Davy, I should be rated ship's boy. But come now, stand by to go about. This won't do. Duty is duty, messmates. I'll put on my old cockerel hat and step along of you to Captain Trelawney and report this here affair. For mind you, it's serious, young Hawkins. And neither you nor me's come out of it with what I should make so bold as to call credit. Nor you neither, says you. Not smart none of the pair of us smart. But dash my buttons. That was a good un about my score. And he began to laugh again, and that so heartily, that though I did not see the joke as he did, I was again obliged to join him in his mirth. On our little walk along the quays, he made himself the most interesting companion, telling me about the different ships that we passed by, their rig, tonnage, and nationality. Explaining the work that was going forward, how one was discharging, another taking in cargo, and a third making ready for sea and every now, and then telling me some little anecdote of ships or seamen, or repeating a nautical phrase till I had learned it perfectly. I began to see that here was one of the best of possible shipmates. When we got to the inn, the squire and Dr. Livesey were seated together, finishing a quart of ale with a toast in it before they should go aboard the schooner on a visit of inspection. Long John told the story from first to last, with a great deal of spirit and the most perfect truth. That was how it were. Now, weren't it, Hawkins, he would say, now and again, and I could always bear him entirely out. The two gentlemen regretted that black dog had got away, but we all agreed there was nothing to be done, and after he had been complimented, Long John took up his crutch and departed, all hands aboard by four this afternoon. Shouted the squire after him, Aye, aye, sir, cried the cook in the passage. Well, squire, said Dr. Livesey, I don't put much faith in your discoveries as a general thing. But I will say this. John Silver suits me. The man's a perfect trump, declared the squire. And now, added the doctor, Jim may come on board with U.S., may he not? To be sure he may, says squire. Take your hat, Hawkins. And we'll see the ship. Nine powder and arms the Hispaniola lay some way out and we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships, and their cables sometimes grated underneath our keel and sometimes swung above us. At last, however, we got alongside and were met 
and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow. A brown old sailor with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man who seemed angry with everything on board and was soon to tell us why. For we had hardly got down into the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, axing to speak with you, said he, I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope, all shipshape and seaworthy. Well, sir, said the captain, better speak plain, I believe, even at the risk of offense. I don't like this cruise, I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir. You don't like the ship, inquired the squire, very angry, as I could see. I can't speak as to that, sir. Not having seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft. More I can't say. Possibly, sir, you may not like your employer, either, says the squire. But here Dr. Livesey cut in, stay a bit, said he, stay a bit. No use of such questions as that, but to produce ill feeling. The captain has said too much, or he has said too little, and I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise. Now, why? I was engaged, sir. On what we call sealed orders, to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me, said the captain, so far so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair, now, do you? No, said Dr. Livesey, I don't. Next, said the captain, I learn we are going after treasure here it from my own hands, mind you. Now, treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them, above all, when they are secret and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot, asked the squire, it's a way of speaking, said the captain, blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you are about but I'll tell you my way of it, life or death and a close run. That is all clear, and I dare say, true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next. You say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett, and I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands if you go to that. Perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should, perhaps, have taken you along with him, but the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself shoot drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? Cried the squire. No, sir, replied the captain, only that he's too familiar. Well, now, and the short and long of it, captain, asked the doctor, tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then, as you've heard me very patiently, saying things that I could not prove. Hear me a few words more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the forehold. 
Now, you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then, you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be birthed forward. Why not give them the berths here beside the cabin? Second point. Any more? Asked Mr. Trelawney. One more, said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett. That you have a map of an island, that there's crosses on the map to show where treasure is, and that the island lies, and then he named the latitude and longitude exactly. I never told that cried the squire to a soul. The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Livesey, that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. It doesn't much matter who it was, replied the doctor. And I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure, he was so loose a talker. Yet in this case, I believe he was really right and that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well, gentlemen, continued the captain, I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point. It shall be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise, I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offense, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No, Captain, sir would be justified in going to sea at all if he had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same. All may be for what I know. But I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man jack aboard of her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right. And I ask you to take certain precautions or let me resign my berth. And that's all. Captain Smollett began the doctor with a smile. Did ever you hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you remind me of that fable. When you came in here, I'll stake my wig. You meant more than this. Doctor, said the captain, you're smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. Had Livesey not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have heard you. I will do as you desire, but I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions. I believed you have managed to get two honest men on board with you that man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire, but as for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright unenglish. Well, says the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had begun already to take out the arms and powder, Yohoanji at their work, while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern out of what had been the after part of the main hold. And this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and forecastle by a sparred passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor, and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Redruth and I were to get two of them and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion. 
which had been enlarged on each side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks. And even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew, but that is only guess, for as you shall hear. We had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work, changing the powder and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off in a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what was doing, so ho, mates, says he, what's this? We're a changing of the powder. Jack, answers one, why, by the powers. Cried Long John, if we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly, you may go below, my man. Hands will want supper. Aye, aye, sir answered the cook. And touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of his galley. That's a good man, Captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, replied Captain Smollett. Easy with that. Men easy, he ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder, and then suddenly observing me examining the swivel we carried amidships, a long brass nine, hear you, ship's boy, he cried. Out, oh that! Off with you to the cook and get some work. And then as I was hurrying off, I heard him say, quite loudly, to the doctor, I'll have no favorites on my ship. I assure you I was quite of the squire's way of thinking, and hated the captain deeply. Ex the voyage all that night, we were in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place. And boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night at the Admiral Benbow when I had half the work. And I was dog tired when, a little before dawn, the bosun sounded his pipe, and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me the brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. Now, barbecue, tip us a stave, cried one voice. The old one cried another, I, I, mates, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, and then the whole crew bore chorus, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum, and at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the anchor was shored up. Soon it was hanging dripping at the bows, soon the sails began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side. And before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I am not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it, for after a day or two at sea he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. 
Sometimes he fell and cut himself. Sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes for a day or two he would be almost sober and attend to his work at least possibly. In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased. We could do nothing to solve it, and when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer and a bad influence amongst the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright, so nobody was much surprised, nor very sorry, when one dark night with a head sea, he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons. But there we were without a mate. And it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Job Anderson, was the likeliest man aboard, and though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for he often took a watch himself in easy weather. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook. Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship, he carried his crutch by a lanyard round his neck to have both hands as free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead and propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship. Get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. Still more strange was it to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the widest spaces long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. He's no common man, Barbecue, said the coxswain to me. He had good schooling in his young days and can speak like a book when so minded and brave lions nothing alongside of Long John. I seen him grapple for and knock their heads together him unarmed. All the crew respected and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me he was unweariedly kind and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin. The dishes hanging up burnished and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Come away, Hawkins, he would say, come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Captain Flint I calls my parrot Captain Flint, after the famous buccaneer hears Captain Flint predicting success to our VH. Wasn't you, Captain? And the parrot would say, with great rapidity, pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. Till you wondered that it was not out of breath or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. Now, that bird, he would say, is, maybe, two hundred years old. Hawkins, they live forever mostly, and if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar and at Malabar and Suriname and Providence and Portobello. 
She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight and little wonder, 350,000 of um, Hawkins. She was at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies out of Goa. She was, and to look at her you would think she was a babby. But you smelt powder, didn't you, Captain? Stand by to go about. The parrot would scream. Ah, she's a handsome craft. She is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket, and then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on. Passing belief for wickedness. There, John would add, you can't touch pitch and not be mucked, lad. Here's this poor old innocent bird, oh, mine swearing blue fire, and none the wiser. You may lay to that. She would swear the same, in a manner of speaking, before Chaplin. And John would touch his forelock with a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime, the squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke, but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry, and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has a right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But he would add, all I say is, we're not home again and I don't like the crews. The squire at this would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air, a trifle more of that man, he would say, and I shall explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise. For it is my belief there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as for instance. If the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy, never knew good come of it yet. The captain said to Dr. Livesey, spoil forecastle hands, make devils. That's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear, for if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get the wind of the island we were after I am not allowed to be more plain and now we were running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage by the largest computation, some time that night, or at latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading SSW and had a steady breeze of beam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing a low and aloft. Everyone was in the bravest spirits because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail and whistling away gently to himself. And that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and around the sides of the ship. And I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left. But sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship. 
I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there. Trembling and listening, in the extreme of fear and curiosity, for from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. Eleven what I heard in the apple barrel, no, not I, said Silver. Flint was captain, I was quartermaster, along of my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg. Old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me out of college and all Latin by the bucket and what not, but he was hanged like a dog and sun dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men, that was, and comrade of changing names to their ship's royal fortune and so on. Now, what a ship was christened. So let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra. As brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies, so it was with the old walrus, Flint's old ship. As I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah, uh, cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint, that's my story, and now here on my own account. In a manner of speaking, I laid by 900 safe from England and 2,000 after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast all safe in bank. Taint earning now, it's saving does it. You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I dunno. Where's Flint's? Why, most on am aboard here, and glad to get the duff been begging before that, some on am. Old Pew, as had lost his sight, and might have thought shame, spends twelve hundred pound in a year, like a lord in parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches, but for two year before that. Shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged, and he stole, and he cut throats, and starved at that, by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after all, said the young seaman. Tain't much use for fools, you may lay to it that, nor nothing, cried Silver. But now, you look here, you're young, you are, but you're as smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I, I think... If I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough. And they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. No! The most goes for rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywheres, by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself, oh, nothing heart desires, and slept, 
soft and ate dainty all my days but when at sea and how did i begin before the mast like you well said the other but all the other money's gone now ain't it you daren't show face in bristol after this why where might you suppose it was asked silver derisively at bristol in banks and places answered his companion it were said the cook it were when we weighed anchor but my old missus has it all by now and the spyglass is sold lease and goodwill and rigging and the old girl's off to meet me i would tell you where for i trust you but it'd make jealousy among the mates and can you trust your missus asked the other gentleman of fortune returned the cook usually trusts little among themselves and right they are you may lay to it but i have a way with me i have when a mate brings a slip on his cable one as knows me i mean it won't be in the same world with old john there was some that was feared of pew and some that was feared of flint but flint his own self was feared of me feared he was and proud they was the roughest crew afloat was flint's the devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them well now i tell you i'm not a boasting man and you seen yourself how easy i keep company but when i was quartermaster lambs wasn't the word for flint's old buccaneers ah uh, you may be sure of yourself in old john's ship well i tell you now replied the lad i didn't half a quarter like the job till i had this talk with you john but there's my hand on it now and a brave lad you were and smart too answered silver shaking hands so heartily that all the barrel shook and a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune i never clapped my eyes on by this time i had begun to understand the meaning of their terms by a gentleman of fortune they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate and the little scene that i had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands perhaps of the last one left aboard but on this point i was soon to be relieved for silver giving a little whistle a third man strolled up and sat down by the party dick square said silver oh i know dick was square returned the voice of the coxswain israel hands he's no fool is dick and he turned his quid and spat but look here he went on here's what i want to know barbecue how long are we going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat i've had a most enough oh captain smollett he's hazed me long enough by thunder i want to go into that cabin i do i want their pickles and wines and that israel said silver your head ain't much account nor ever was but you're able to hear i reckon leastways your ears is big enough now here's what i say you'll berth forward and you'll live hard and you'll speak soft and you'll keep sober till i give the word and you may lay to that my son well i don't say no do i growled the coxswain what i say is when that's what i say when by the powers cried silver well now if you want to know i'll tell you when the last moment i can manage and that's when here's a first-rate seaman captain smollett sails the blessed ship for us here's the squire and doctor with a map and such i don't know where it is do i no more do you says you well then i mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers then we'll see if i was sure of you all sons of double dutchmen i'd have captain smollett navigate us halfway back again before i struck why we're all seamen aboard here i should think said the lad dick 
We're all forecastle hands, you mean. Snap, silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with M at the island, as soon's the blunt's on board, and a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides, I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all. Long John, cried Israel, who's a crossin' of you? Why, how many tall ships, think ye, now, have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock, cried Silver. And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry. You hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you would ony lay your course and a peant to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you. I know you. You'll have your mouth full of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody knowed you was a kind of a chaplain, John, but there's others as could hand and steer as well as you. Said Israel, they liked a bit o' oh, fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling, like jolly companions every one. So, says Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, uh, there was a sweet crew, they was. Ani, where are they? But, ask Dick, when we do lay em athwart. What are we to do with em, anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put em ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way or cut M down like that much pork. That would have been Flint's or Billy Bones's. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and short on it now. And if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver, rough and ruddy. But mark you here. I'm an easy man, I'm quite the gentleman, says you, but this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote death, when I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach. I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a coming home, unlooked for, like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why, let her rip. John cries the coxswain. You're a man. You'll say so. Israel, when you see, said Silver, only one thing I claim, I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calves head off his body with these hands, Dick, he added, breaking off. You just jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leaped out and run for it if I had found the strength. But my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, Oh, stow that. Don't you get sucking of that bilge, John. Let's have a go of the rum. Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while. And during his absence, Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news. For besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will jine. 
Hence, there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank one to luck, another with a here's to old Flint and Silver himself saying, in a kind of song, here's to ourselves and hold your luff. Plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel and looking up, I found the moon had risen and was silvering the mizzen top and shining white on the luff of the foresail, and almost at the same time the voice of the lookout shouted, Land Ho. Twelve council of war there was a great rush of feet across the deck. I could hear people tumbling up from the cabin and the forecastle, and slipping in an instant outside my barrel. I dived behind the foresail made a double towards the stern, and came out upon the open deck in time to join Hunter and Dr. Livesey in the rush for the weather bow. Their all hands were already congregated. A belt of fog had lifted almost simultaneously with the appearance of the moon. Away to the southwest of us we saw two low hills. About a couple of miles apart, and rising behind one of them a third and higher hill, whose peak was still buried in the fog. All three seemed sharp and conical in figure. So much I saw. Almost in a dream, for I had not yet recovered from my horrid fear of a minute or two before. And then I heard the voice of Captain Smollett issuing orders. The Hispaniola was laid a couple of points nearer the wind, and now sailed a course that would just clear the island on the east. And now, men, said the captain, when all was sheeted home. Has any one of you ever seen that land ahead? I have, sir, said Silver. I've watered there with a traitor I was cooking. The anchorage is on the south, behind an islet, I fancy asked the captain. Yes. Sir, Skeleton Island, they calls it. It were a main place for pirates once, and a hand we had on board knowed all their names for it. That hill to the Norard they calls the Foremast Hill. There are three hills in a row running southard for main and mizzen, sir. But the main that's the big un, with the cloud on it they usually calls the spyglass. By reason of a lookout they kept when they was in the anchorage cleaning, for it's there they clean their ships, sir, asking your pardon. I have a chart here, says Captain Smollett. See if that's the place. Long John's eyes burned in his head as he took the chart but by the fresh look of the paper I knew he was doomed to disappointment. This was not the map we found in Billy Bones's chest, but an accurate copy. Complete in all things names and heights and soundings with the single exception of the red crosses and the written notes. Sharp as must have been his annoyance. Silver had the strength of mind to hide it. Yes, sir, said he. This is the spot, to be sure, and very prettily drawed out. Who might have done that, I wonder? The pirates were too ignorant, I reckon. Aye, here it is. Captain, Kid's Anchorage just the name my shipmate called it. There's a strong current runs along the south, and then away Norard up the west coast. Right you was, sir, says he to haul your wind and keep the weather of the island. Leastways, if such was your intention as to enter and careen, and there ain't no better place for that in these waters. Thank you, my man, says Captain Smollett. I'll ask you later on to give us a help. You may go. I was surprised at the coolness with which John avowed his knowledge of the island, and I own I was half frightened when I saw him drawing nearer to myself. He did not know, to be sure, that I had overheard his counsel from the apple barrel. And yet I had by this time taken such a horror of his cruelty, duplicity, and power that I could scarce conceal a shudder when he laid his hand upon my arm. Ah, says he, 
This here is a sweet spot. This island a sweet spot for a lad to get ashore on. You'll bathe, and you'll climb trees, and you'll hunt goats, you will, and you'll get aloft on them hills like a goat yourself. Why? It makes me young again. I was going to forget my timber leg, I was. It's a pleasant thing to be young and have ten toes, and you may lay to that. When you want to go a bit of exploring, you just ask old John, and he'll put up a snack for you to take along. And clapping me in the friendliest way upon the shoulder, he hobbled off forward and went below. Captain Smollett. The squire and Dr. Livesey were talking together on the quarter-deck, and anxious as I was to tell them my story, I durst not interrupt them openly. While I was still casting about in my thoughts to find some probable excuse, Dr. Livesey called me to his side. He had left his pipe below, and, being a slave to tobacco, had meant that I should fetch it, but as soon as I was near enough to speak and not to be overheard, I broke immediately, Doctor. Let me speak. Get the captain and squire down to the cabin, and then make some pretense to send for me. I have terrible news. The doctor changed countenance a little, but next moment he was master of himself. Thank you, Jim, said he quite loudly. That was all I wanted to know, as if he had asked me a question. And with that he turned on his heel and rejoined the other two. They spoke together for a little. And though none of them started, or raised his voice, or so much as whistled, it was plain enough that Dr. Livesey had communicated my request. For the next thing that I heard was the captain giving an order to Job Anderson, and all hands were piped on deck. My lads, said Captain Smollett, I've a word to say to you. This land that we have sighted is the place we have been sailing for. Mr. Trelawney, being a very open-handed gentleman, as we all know, has just asked me a word or two. And as I was able to tell him that every man on board had done his duty, alow and aloft, as I never asked to see it done better, why? He and I and the doctor are going below to the cabin to drink your health and luck, and you'll have grog served out for you to drink our health and luck. I'll tell you what I think of this. I think it handsome. And if you think as I do, you'll give a good sea cheer for the gentleman that does it. The cheer followed that was a matter of course. But it rang out so full and hearty that I confess I could hardly believe these same men were plotting for our blood. One more cheer for Captain Smollett. Cried Long John when the first had subsided. And this also was given with a will. On the top of that the three gentlemen went below, and not long after. Word was sent forward that Jim Hawkins was wanted in the cabin. I found them all three seated round the table, a bottle of Spanish wine and some raisins before them. And the doctor smoking away, with his wig on his lap, and that, I knew, was a sign that he was agitated. The stern window was open, for it was a warm night. And you could see the moon shining behind on the ship's wake. Now, Hawkins, said the squire, you have something to say. Speak up. I did as I was bid, and as short as I could make it. Told the whole details of Silver's conversation. Nobody interrupted me till I was done, nor did any one of the three of them make so much as a movement. But they kept their eyes upon my face from first to last. Jim, said Dr. Livesey, take a seat. And they made me sit down at table beside them, poured me out a glass of wine, filled my hands with raisins, and all three, one after the other, and each with a bow, drank my good health and their service to me, for my luck and courage. Now, Captain, said the squire, you were right and I was wrong. 
I own myself an ass, and I await your orders. No more an ass than I, sir, returned the captain. I never heard of a crew that meant to mutiny, but what showed signs before, for any man that had an eye in his head to see the mischief and take steps according. But this crew, he added, beats me. Captain, said the doctor, with your permission, that's Silver, a very remarkable man. He'd look remarkably well from a yardarm, sir, returned the captain, but this is talk. This don't lead to anything. I see three or four points, and with Mr. Trelawney's permission, I'll name them. You, sir, are the captain. It is for you to speak, says Mr. Trelawney grandly. First point, began Mr. Smollett. We must go on, because we can't turn back. If I gave the word to go about, they would rise at once. Second point. We have time before us at least until this treasure's found. Third point, there are faithful hands. Now, sir, it's got to come to blows sooner or later. And what I propose is to take time by the forelock, as the saying is, and come to blows some fine day when they least expect it. We can count, I take it, on your own home servants, Mr. Trelawney. As upon myself, declared the squire. Three, reckoned the captain. Ourselves make seven, counting Hawkins here. Now, about the honest hands, most likely Trelawney's own men, said the doctor. Those he had picked up for himself before he lit on silver. Nay, replied the squire, hands was one of mine. I did think I could have trusted hands, added the captain. And to think that they're all Englishmen, broke out the squire. Sir, I could find it in my heart to blow the ship up. Well, gentlemen, said the captain, the best that I can say is not much. We must lay to, if you please, and keep a bright lookout. It's trying on a man, I know. It would be pleasanter to come to blows. But there's no help for it till we know our men. Lay to and whistle for a wind, that's my view. Jim here, said the doctor, can help us more than anyone. The men are not shy with him, and Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you, added the squire. I began to feel pretty desperate at this, for I felt altogether helpless, and yet, by an odd train of circumstances, it was indeed through me that safety came. In the meantime, talk as we pleased, there were only seven out of the twenty-six on whom we knew we could rely, and out of these seven one was a boy, so that the grown men on our side were six to their nineteen. Part three, my shore adventure thirteen, how I began my shore adventure, the appearance of the island when I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way during the night, and were now lying becalmed about half a mile to the southeast of the low eastern coast. Grey-colored woods covered a large part of the surface. This even tint was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sand break in the lower lands, and by many tall trees of the pine family. Outtopping the others some singly, some in clumps, but the general coloring was uniform and sad. The hills ran up clear above the vegetation in spires of naked rock. All were strangely shaped, and the spyglass, which was by three or four hundred feet the tallest on the island, was likewise the strangest in configuration. Running up sheer from almost every side, and then suddenly cut off at the top like a pedestal to put a statue on. The Hispaniola was rolling scuppers under in the ocean swell. The booms were tearing at the blocks, the rudder was banging to and fro, and the whole ship creaking, groaning, and jumping like a manufactory. I had to cling tight to the backstay. 
and the world turned giddily before my eyes, for though I was a good enough sailor when there was way on. This standing still and being rolled about like a bottle was a thing I never learned to stand without a qualm or so, above all in the morning, on an empty stomach. Perhaps it was this, perhaps it was the look of the island, with its gray, melancholy woods and wild stone spires, and the surf that we could both see and hear foaming and thundering on the steep beach at least, although the sun shone bright and hot, and the shore birds were fishing and crying all around us, and you would have thought anyone would have been glad to get to land after being so long at sea, my heart sank, as the saying is, into my boots, and from the first look onward, I hated the very thought of Treasure Island. We had a dreary morning's work before us, for there was no sign of any wind, and the boats had to be got out and manned, and the ship warped three or four miles round the corner of the island and up the narrow passage to the haven behind Skeleton Island. I volunteered for one of the boats, where I had, of course, no business. The heat was sweltering, and the men grumbled fiercely over their work. Anderson was in command of my boat, and instead of keeping the crew in order, he grumbled as loud as the worst. Well, he said with an oath, it's not forever. I thought this was a very bad sign, for up to that day the men had gone briskly and willingly about their business, but the very sight of the island had relaxed the cords of discipline. All the way in, Long John stood by the steersman and conned the ship. He knew the passage like the palm of his hand, and though the man in the chains got everywhere more water than was down in the chart, John never hesitated once. There's a strong scour with the ebb, he said, and this here passage has been dug out, in a manner of speaking, with a spade. We brought up just where the anchor was in the chart, about a third of a mile from each shore, the mainland on one side and Skeleton Island on the other. The bottom was clean sand. The plunge of our anchor sent up clouds of birds wheeling and crying over the woods, but in less than a minute they were down again and all was once more silent. The place was entirely landlocked, buried in woods, the trees coming right down to high water mark, the shores mostly flat, and the hilltops standing round at a distance in a sort of amphitheater, one here, one there. Two little rivers, or rather two swamps, emptied out into this pond, as you might call it. And the foliage round that part of the shore had a kind of poisonous brightness. From the ship we could see nothing of the house or stockade, for they were quite buried among trees. And if it had not been for the chart on the companion, we might have been the first that had ever anchored there since the island arose out of the seas. There was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound, but that of the surf booming half a mile away along the beaches and against the rocks outside. A peculiar stagnant smell hung over the anchorage, a smell of sodden leaves and rotting tree trunks. I observed the doctor sniffing and sniffing, like someone tasting a bad egg. I don't know about treasure, he said, but I'll stake my wig there's fever here. If the conduct of the men had been alarming in the boat, it became truly threatening when they had come aboard. They lay about the deck growling together and talk. The slightest order was received with a black look and grudgingly and carelessly obeyed. Even the honest hands must have caught the infection, for there was not one man aboard to mend another. Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. And it was not only we of the cabin party who perceived the danger. Long John was hard at work going from group to group, 
spending himself in good advice. And as, for example, no man could have shown a better, he fairly outstripped himself in willingness and civility. He was all smiles to everyone. If an order were given, John would be on his crutch in an instant with the cheeriest I, I, sir, in the world. And when there was nothing else to do, he kept up one song after another as if to conceal the discontent of the rest. Of all the gloomy features of that gloomy afternoon, this obvious anxiety on the part of Long John appeared the worst. We held a council in the cabin. Sir, said the captain, if I risk another order, the whole ship will come about our ears by the run. You see, sir, here it is. I get a rough answer, do I not? Well, if I speak back, pikes will be going in two shakes. If I don't, silver will see there's something under that, and the game's up. Now, we've only one man to rely on. And who is that? asked the squire. Silver, sir, returned the captain. He's as anxious as you and I to smother things up. This is a tiff. He'd soon talk M out of it if he had the chance. And what I propose to do is to give him the chance. Let's allow the men an afternoon ashore. If they all go, why we'll fight the ship. If they none of them go, well then, we hold the cabin. And God defend the right. If some go, you mark my words, sir. Silver will bring Emma aboard again as mild as lambs. It was so decided. Loaded pistols were served out to all the sure men. Hunter, Joyce, and Rudruth were taken into our confidence and received the news with less surprise and a better spirit than we had looked for. And then the captain went on deck and addressed the crew. My lads, said he, we've had a hot day and are all tired and out of sorts. A turn ashore will hurt nobody the boats are still in the water. You can take the gigs. And as many as please may go ashore for the afternoon. I'll fire a gun half an hour before sundown. I believe the silly fellows must have thought they would break their shins over treasure as soon as they were landed. For they all came out of their sulks in a moment and gave a cheer that started the echo in a faraway hill and sent the birds once more flying and squalling round the anchorage. The captain was too bright to be in the way. He whipped out of sight in a moment, leaving Silver to arrange the party, and I fancy it was as well he did so. Had he been on deck? He could no longer so much as have pretended not to understand the situation. It was as plain as day. Silver was the captain, and a mighty rebellious crew he had of it. The honest hands and I was soon to see it proved that there were such on board must have been very stupid fellows. Or rather, I suppose the truth was this that all hands were disaffected by the example of the ringleaders only some more, some less, and a few, being good fellows in the main, could neither be led nor driven any further. It is one thing to be idle and skulk and quite another to take a ship and murder a number of innocent men. At last, however, the party was made up. Six fellows were to stay on board, and the remaining thirteen, including Silver, began to embark. Then it was that there came into my head the first of the mad notions that contributed so much to save our lives. If six men were left by Silver, it was plain our party could not take and fight the ship, and since only six were left, it was equally plain that the cabin party had no present need of my assistance. It occurred to me at once to go ashore. In a jiffy I had slipped over the side and curled up in the four sheets of the nearest boat, and almost at the same moment she shoved off. No one took notice of me, only the bow or saying, Is that you, Jim? Keep your head down. But Silver, 
from the other boat, looked sharply over and called out to know if that were me, and from that moment I began to regret what I had done. The crews raced for the beach, but the boat I was in, having some start and being at once the lighter and the better manned, shot far ahead of her consort. And the bow had struck among the shoreside trees, and I had caught a branch and swung myself out and plunged into the nearest thicket while Silver and the rest were still a hundred yards behind. Jim, Jim, I heard him shouting, but you may suppose I paid no heed, jumping, ducking, and breaking through, I ran straight before my nose till I could run no longer. Fourteen the first blow, I was so pleased at having given the slip to Long John that I began to enjoy myself and look around me with some interest on the strange land that I was in. I had crossed a marshy tract full of willows, bulrushes, and odd, outlandish, swampy trees, and I had now come out upon the skirts of an open piece of undulating, sandy country. About a mile long, dotted with a few pines and a great number of contorted trees, not unlike the oak in growth, but pale in the foliage, like willows. On the far side of the open stood one of the hills, with two quaint, craggy peaks shining vividly in the sun. I now felt for the first time the joy of exploration. The isle was uninhabited. My shipmates I had left behind, and nothing lived in front of me but dumb brutes and fowls. I turned hither and thither among the trees. Here and there were flowering plants unknown to me. Here and there I saw snakes, and one raised his head from a ledge of rock and hissed at me with a noise not unlike the spinning of a top. Little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy and that the noise was the famous rattle. Then I came to a long thicket of these oak-like trees live, or evergreen, oaks. I heard afterwards they should be called which grew low along the sand like brambles, the boughs curiously twisted, the foliage compact like thatch. The thicket stretched down from the top of one of the sandy knolls, spreading and growing taller as it went, until it reached the margin of the broad, reedy fin, through which the nearest of the little river soaked its way into the anchorage. The marsh was steaming in the strong sun, and the outline of the spyglass trembled through the haze. All at once there began to go a sort of bustle among the bulrushes. A wild duck flew up with a quack, another followed, and soon over the whole surface of the marsh a great cloud of birds hung screaming and circling in the air. I judged at once that some of my shipmates must be drawing near along the borders of the fin. Nor was I deceived, for soon I heard the very distant and low tones of a human voice, which, as I continued to give ear, grew steadily louder and nearer. This put me in a great fear, and I crawled under cover of the nearest live oak and squatted there, hearkening. As silent as a mouse, another voice answered, and then the first voice, which I now recognized to be Silver's, once more took up the story and ran on for a long while in a stream, only now and again interrupted by the other. By the sound they must have been talking earnestly and almost fiercely, but no distinct word came to my hearing. At last the speaker seemed to have paused and perhaps to have sat down, for not only did they cease to draw any nearer, but the birds themselves began to grow more quiet and to settle again to their places in the swamp. And now I began to feel that I was neglecting my business. That since I had been so foolhardy as to come ashore with these desperadoes, the least I could do was to overhear them at their councils, and that my plain and obvious duty was to draw as close as I could manage under the favorable ambush of the crouching trees. 
I could tell the direction of the speakers pretty exactly. Not only by the sound of their voices, but by the behavior of the few birds that still hung in alarm above the heads of the intruders. Crawling on all fours, I made steadily but slowly towards them till at last, raising my head to an aperture among the leaves, I could see clear down into a little green dell beside the marsh, and closely set about with trees, where Long John Silver and another of the crew stood face to face in conversation. The sun beat full upon them. Silver had thrown his hat beside him on the ground, and his great, smooth, blonde face, all shining with heat, was lifted to the other man's in a kind of appeal. Mate, he was saying. It's because I thinks gold dust of you gold dust, and you may lay to that. If I hadn't took to you like pitch, do you think I'd have been here a warning of you? All's up you can't make nor mend. It's to save your neck that I'm a speaking, and if one of the wild UNS knew it, where'd I be? Tom now, tell me, where'd I be? Silver said the other man and I observed he was not only red in the face, but spoke as hoarse as a crow, and his voice shook too, like a taut rope. Silver, says he, you're old, and you're honest, or has the name for it, and you've money too, which lots of purse sailors hasn't. And you're brave, or I'm mistook. And will you tell me you'll let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swabs? Not you. As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner lose my hand. If I turn Egan my duty, and then all of a sudden he was interrupted by a noise. I had found one of the honest hands well. Here, at that same moment, came news of another. Far away out in the marsh there arose. All of a sudden, a sound like the cry of anger, then another on the back of it, and then one horrid, long-drawn scream. The rocks of the spyglass re-echoed it a score of times. The whole troop of marsh birds rose again, darkening heaven with a simultaneous whir, and long after that death yell was still ringing in my brain. Silence had re-established its empire, and only the rustle of the redescending birds and the boom of the distant surges disturbed the languor of the afternoon. Tom had leaped at the sound, like a horse at the spur, but Silver had not winked an eye. He stood where he was, resting lightly on his crutch. Watching his companion like a snake about to spring, John, said the sailor, stretching out his hand. Hands off, cried Silver, leaping back a yard, as it seemed to me. With the speed and security of a trained gymnast, hands off, if you like, John Silver, said the other. It's a black conscience that can make you feared of me. But in heaven's name, tell me. What was that? That returned Silver, smiling away, but warier than ever, his eye a mere pinpoint in his big face, but gleaming like a crumb of glass. That, oh, I reckon that'll be Alan. And at this point, Tom flashed out like a hero. Alan, he cried, then rest his soul for a true seaman. And as for you, John Silver, long you've been a mate of mine, but you're made of mine no more. If I die like a dog, I'll die in my duty. You've killed Alan, have you? Kill me too, if you can, but I defies you. And with that, this brave fellow turned his back directly on the cook and set off walking for the beach. But he was not destined to go far. With a cry, John seized the branch of a tree, whipped the crutch out of his armpit, and sent that uncouth missile hurtling through the air. It struck per Tom, point foremost, and with stunning violence, right between the shoulders and the middle of his back. His hands flew up, he gave a sort of gasp, and fell. 
Whether he were injured much or a little, none could ever tell. Like enough. To judge from the sound, his back was broken on the spot. But he had no time given him to recover. Silver, agile as a monkey even without leg or crutch, was on the top of him next moment and had twice buried his knife up to the hilt in that defenseless body. From my place of ambush, I could hear him pant aloud as he struck the blows. I do not know what it rightly is to faint, but I do know that for the next little while the whole world swam away from before me in a whirling mist, silver and the birds, and the tall spyglass hilltop going round and round and topsy-turvy before my eyes and all manner of bells ringing and distant voices shouting in my ear. When I came again to myself, the monster had pulled himself together, his crutch under his arm, his hat upon his head. Just before him, Tom lay motionless upon the sward. But the murderer minded him not a whit, cleansing his blood-stained knife the while upon a wisp of grass. Everything else was unchanged. The sun still shining mercilessly on the steaming marsh and the tall pinnacle of the mountain. And I could scarce persuade myself that murder had been actually done and a human life cruelly cut short a moment since before my eyes. But now John put his hand into his pocket, brought out a whistle, and blew upon it several modulated blasts that rang far across the heated air. I could not tell, of course, the meaning of the signal, but it instantly awoke my fears. More men would be coming. I might be discovered. They had already slain two of the honest people. After Tom and Alan, might not I come next? Instantly, I began to extricate myself and crawl back again with what speed and silence I could manage to the more open portion of the wood. As I did so, I could hear Hales coming and going between the old buccaneer and his comrades, and this sound of danger lent me wings. As soon as I was clear of the thicket, I ran as I never ran before. Scarce minding the direction of my flight, so long as it led me from the murderers, and as I ran, fear grew and grew upon me until it turned into a kind of frenzy. Indeed. Could anyone be more entirely lost than I? When the gun fired, how should I dare to go down to the boats among those fiends, still smoking from their crime? Would not the first of them who saw me wring my neck like a snipe's? Would not my absence itself be an evidence to them of my alarm, and therefore of my fatal knowledge? It was all over. I thought... Goodbye to the Hispaniola, goodbye to the squire, the doctor, and the captain. There was nothing left for me but death by starvation or death by the hands of the mutineers. All this while, as I say, I was still running and without taking any notice. I had drawn near to the foot of the little hill with the two peaks and had got into a part of the island where the live oaks grew more widely apart and seemed more like forest trees in their bearing and dimensions. Mingled with these were a few scattered pines, some fifty, some nearer seventy feet high. The air too smelt more freshly than down beside the marsh. And here a fresh alarm brought me to a standstill with a thumping heart. Fifteen the man of the island from the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony. A spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction. And I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bear or man or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy, more I knew not. But the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides, behind me the murderers, before me this lurking nondescript. 
and immediately I began to prefer the dangers that I knew to those I knew not. Silver himself appeared less terrible in contrast with this creature of the woods, and I turned on my heel, and looking sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retrace my steps in the direction of the boats. Instantly the figure reappeared, and making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired, at any rate, but had I been as fresh as when I rose, I could see it was in vain for me to contend in speed with such an adversary. From trunk to trunk the creature flitted like a deer, running manlike on two legs, but unlike any man that I had ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran. Yet a man it was, I could no longer be in doubt about that. I began to recall what I had heard of cannibals. I was within an ace of calling for help. But the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, had somewhat reassured me, and my fear of silver began to revive in proportion. I stood still, therefore, and cast about for some method of escape, and as I was so thinking, the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered I was not defenseless, Courage glowed again in my heart, and I set my face resolutely for this man of the island and walked briskly towards him. He was concealed by this time behind another tree trunk, but he must have been watching me closely, for as soon as I began to move in his direction he reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, came forward again. And at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that I once more stopped, Who are you? I asked, Ben Gunn, he answered. And his voice sounded hoarse and awkward, like a rusty lock. I'm per Ben Gunn, I am, and I haven't spoke with a Christian these three years. I could now see that he was a white man like myself and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever it was exposed, was burned by the sun, even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. Of all the beggar men that I had seen or fancied, he was the chief for raggedness. He was clothed with tatters of old ship's canvas and old sea cloth, and this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings, brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of tarry gaskin. About his waist he wore an old brass buckled leather belt, which was the one thing solid in his whole accoutrement, three years. I cried, were you shipwrecked? Nay, mate, said he, marooned. I had heard the word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment common enough among the buccaneers, in which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and shot and left behind on some desolate and distant island, marooned three years agone, he continued and lived on goats since then, and berries, and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But, mate, my heart is sore for cr and lived on goats since then, and berries, and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But, mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mightn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you, no? No? Well, many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese toasted, mostly and woke up again, and here I were. If ever I can get aboard again, said I, you shall have cheese by the stone. All this time he had been feeling the stuff of my jacket, smoothing my hands, looking at my boots, and generally... In the intervals of his speech, 
showing a childish pleasure in the presence of a fellow creature. But at my last words, he perked up into a kind of startled slyness. If ever you can get aboard again, says you, he repeated, why, now, who's to hinder you? Not you, I know, was my reply, and right you was, he cried, now you what do you call yourself, mate? Jim, I told him. Jim, Jim, says he, quite pleased apparently. Well, now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, you wouldn't think I had had a pious mother to look at me, he asked. Why, no, not in particular, I answered. Ah, well, said he, but I had remarkable pious. And I was a civil, pious boy and could rattle off my catechism that fast, as you couldn't tell one word from another. And here's what it come to, Jim, and it begun with Chuck Farthen on the blessed gravestones. That's what it begun with, but it went further on that. And so my mother told me, and predict the whole, she did, the pious woman. But it were providence that put me here. I've thought it all out in this here lonely island, and I'm back on piety. You don't catch me tasting rum so much, but just a thimbleful for luck, of course, the first chance I have. I'm bound I'll be good, and I see the way to. And, Jim? Looking all round him and lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt sure that the poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude, and I suppose I must have shown the feeling in my face. For he repeated the statement hotly, rich, rich, I says, and I'll tell you what, I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, uh, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will, you was the first that found me. And at this there came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face, and he tightened his grasp upon my hand and raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. Now, Jim, you tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship, he asked. At this I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I had found an ally, and I answered him at once. It's not Flint's ship and Flint is dead. But I'll tell you true, as you ask me there are some of Flint's hands aboard. Worse luck for the rest of us. Not a man with one leg, he gasped, Silver. I asked, ah, uh, Silver, says he, that were his name. He's the cook and the ringleader too. He was still holding me by the wrist, and at that he give it quite a ring. If you was sent by Long John, he said, I'm as good as pork and I know it. But where was you, do you suppose? I had made my mind up in a moment and by way of answer told him the whole story of our voyage and the predicament in which we found ourselves. He heard me with the keenest interest and when I had done he patted me on the head. You're a good lad, Jim, he said, and you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gun Ben Gun's the man to do it. Would you think it likely, now, that your squire would prove a liberal-minded one in case of help him being in a clove hitch? As you remark, I told him the squire was the most liberal of men. I, but you see, returned Ben Gun. I didn't mean giving me a gate to keep, and a suit of livery clothes, and such. That's not my mark. Jim. What I mean is, would he be likely to come down to the tune of, say, one thousand pounds out of money that's as good as a man's own already? I am sure he would, said I, as it was. All hands were to share. And a passage home? He added with a look of great shrewdness. Why, I cried, the squire's a gentleman. And besides, if we got rid of the others. 
We should want you to help work the vessel home. Ah, uh, said he, so you would. And he seemed very much relieved. Now, I'll tell you what, he went on. So much I'll tell you, and no more. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure. He and six, along six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week, and us standing off and on in the old walrus. One fine day up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf. The sun was getting up, and mortal white he looked about the cutwater, but there he was, you mind, and the six all dead dead and buried. How he done it? Not a man aboard us could make out. It was battle, murder, and sudden death, leastways him against six. Billy Bones was the mate. Long John, he was quartermaster, and they asked him where the treasure was. Ah, uh, says he, you can go ashore, if you like, and stay, he says, but as for the ship. She'll beat up for more, by thunder. That's what he said. Well, I was in another ship three years back, and we sighted this island. Boys, said I, here's Flint's treasure. Let's land and find it. The captain was displeased at that, but my messmates were all of a mind and landed. Twelve days they looked for it, and every day they had the worst word for me. Until one fine morning, all hands went aboard. As for you, Benjamin Gunn, says they, here's a musket, they says, and a spade, and pickaxe. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself. They says, well, Jim, three years have I been here, and not a bite of Christian diet from that day to this. But now, you look here, look at me. Do I look like a man before the mast? No, says you. Nor I weren't. Neither, I says. And with that he winked and pinched me hard. Just you mention them words to your squire, Jim. He went on. Nor he weren't. Neither that's the words. Three years he were the man of this island. Light and dark, fair and rain. And sometimes he would maybe think upon a prayer, says you and sometimes he would maybe think of his old mother. So be as she's alive, you'll say, but the most part of Gunn's time, this is what you'll say, the most part of his time was took up with another matter, and then you'll give him a nip like I do. And he pinched me again in the most confidential manner. Then he continued, then you'll up, and you'll say this, Gunn is a good man you'll say. And he puts a precious sight, more confidence a precious sight. Mind that in a Gen Lehman born than in these Gen Lehman of fortune, having been one himself. Well, I said, I don't understand one word that you've been saying, but that's neither here nor there. For how am I to get on board? Ah, uh, said he, that's the hitch for sure. Well, there's my boat. That I made with my two hands. I keep her under the white rock. If the worst come to the worst, we might try that after dark. Hi, he broke out. What's that? For just then. Although the sun had still an hour or two to run, all the echoes of the island awoke and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon. They have begun to fight. I cried, follow me. And I began to run towards the anchorage, my terrors all forgotten, while close at my side the marooned man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly. Left, left, says he. Keep to your left hand, mate Jim. Under the trees with you. There's where I killed my first goat. They don't come down here now. They're all masthead on the mountings for the fear of Benjamin Gunn. Ah, and there's the Cedamary Cemetery he must have meant. You see the mounds? I come here and prayed, 
nows and thens. When I thought maybe a Sunday would be about due, it weren't quite a chapel, but it seemed more solemn-like. And then, says you, Ben Gunn was short-handed no chaplain. Nor so much as a Bible and a flag, you says. So he kept talking as I ran, neither expecting nor receiving any answer. The cannon shot was followed after a considerable interval by a volley of small arms. Another pause and then, not a quarter of a mile in front of me. I beheld the Union Jack flutter in the air above a wood. Part 4 The Stockade 16 Narrative Continued by the Doctor How the ship was abandoned it was about half past one three bells in the sea phrase that the two boats went ashore from the Hispaniola. The captain, the squire, and I were talking matters over in the cabin. Had there been a breath of wind, we should have fallen on the six mutineers who were left aboard with us, slipped our cable, and away to sea. But the wind was wanting, and to complete our helplessness, down came Hunter with the news that Jim Hawkins had slipped into a boat and was gone ashore with the rest. It never occurred to us to doubt Jim Hawkins, but we were alarmed for his safety. With the men and the temper they were in, it seemed an even chance if we should see the lad again. We ran on deck. The pitch was bubbling in the seams. The nasty stench of the place turned me sick. If ever a man smelt fever and dysentery, it was in that abominable anchorage. The six scoundrels were sitting grumbling under a sail in the forecastle. Ashore we could see the gigs made fast and a man sitting in each, hard by where the river runs in. One of them was whistling Lillibolero. Waiting was a strain, and it was decided that Hunter and I should go ashore with the jolly boat in quest of information. The gigs had leaned to their right, but Hunter and I pulled straight in, in the direction of the stockade upon the chart. The two who were left guarding their boats seemed in a bustle at our appearance. Lillibolero stopped off, and I could see the pair discussing what they ought to do. Had they gone and told Silver, all might have turned out differently, but they had their orders, I suppose, and decided to sit quietly where they were and hark back again to Lillibolero. There was a slight bend in the coast, and I steered so as to put it between us. Even before we landed, we had thus lost sight of the gigs. I jumped out and came as near running as I durst. With a big silk handkerchief under my hat for coolness sake, and a brace of pistols ready primed for safety, I had not gone a hundred yards when I reached the stockade. This was how it was. A spring of clear water rose almost at the top of a knoll. Well, on the knoll and enclosing the spring. They had clapped a stout log house bit to hold two score of people on a pinch and loopholed for musketry on either side. All round this they had cleared a wide space. And then the thing was completed by a paling six feet high, without door or opening too strong to pull down without time and labor, and too open to shelter the besiegers. The people in the log house had them in every way. They stood quiet in shelter and shot the others like partridges. All they wanted was a good watch and food, for, short of a complete surprise, they might have held the place against a regiment. What particularly took my fancy was the spring. For though we had a good enough place of it in the cabin of the Hispaniola, with plenty of arms and ammunition, and things to eat, and excellent wines, there had been one thing overlooked we had no water. I was thinking this over when there came ringing over the island the cry of a man at the point of death. I was not new to violent death, I have served His Royal Highness the Duke of Cumberland, and got a wound myself at Fontenoy, but I know my pulse went, and carry one. Jim Hawkins is gone. 
was my first thought. It is something to have been an old soldier, but more still to have been a doctor. There is no time to dilly-dally in our work. And so now I made up my mind instantly. And with no time lost returned to the shore and jumped on board the jolly boat. By good fortune Hunter pulled a good oar. We made the water fly. And the boat was soon alongside and I aboard the schooner. I found them all shaken, as was natural. The squire was sitting down, as white as a sheet, thinking of the harm he had led us to. The good soul. And one of the six forecastle hands was little better. There's a man, says Captain Smollett, nodding towards him, new to this work. He came nigh hand fainting, doctor, when he heard the cry. Another touch of the rudder, and that man would join us. I told my plan to the captain, and between us we settled on the details of its accomplishment. We put old Rudruth in the gallery between the cabin and the forecastle, with three or four loaded muskets, and a mattress for protection. Hunter brought the boat round under the stern port, and Joyce and I set to work loading her with powder tins, muskets, bags of biscuits, kegs of pork, a cask of cognac, and my invaluable medicine chest. In the meantime, the squire and the captain stayed on deck, and the latter hailed the coxswain, who was the principal man aboard. Mr. Hands, he said, here are two of us with a brace of pistols each. If any one of you six make a signal of any description, that man's dead. They were a good deal taken aback. And after a little consultation one and all tumbled down the fore companion, thinking no doubt to take us on the rear. But when they saw Rudruth waiting for them in the sparred galley, they went about ship at once and a head popped out again on deck. Down, dog, cries the captain. And the head popped back again, and we heard no more for the time. Of these six very faint-hearted seamen, by this time, tumbling things in as they came, we had the jolly boat loaded as much as we dared. Joyce and I got out through the stern port, and we made for shore again as fast as oars could take us. This second trip fairly aroused the watchers along shore. Lilla Valero was dropped again. And just before we lost sight of them behind the little point, one of them whipped ashore and disappeared. I had half a mind to change my plan and destroy their boats, but I feared that Silver and the others might be close at hand, and all might very well be lost by trying for too much. We had soon touched land in the same place as before and set to provision the blockhouse. All three made the first journey, heavily laden, and tossed our stores over the palisade. Then, leaving Joyce to guard them one man, to be sure, but with half a dozen muskets hunter, and I returned to the jolly boat and loaded ourselves once more. So we proceeded without pausing to take breath till the whole cargo was bestowed, when the two servants took up their position in the blockhouse, and I, with all my power, sculled back to the Hispaniola. That we should have risked a second boatload seems more daring than it really was. They had the advantage of numbers, of course, but we had the advantage of arms. Not one of the men ashore had a musket, and before they could get within range for pistol shooting, we flattered ourselves we should be able to give a good account of a half dozen at least. The squire was waiting for me at the stern window, all his faintness gone from him. He caught the painter and made it fast, and we fell to loading the boat for our very lives. Pork, powder, and biscuit was the cargo. With only a musket and a cutlass apiece for the squire and me and Redruth and the captain. 
The rest of the arms and powder we dropped overboard in two fathoms and a half of water, so that we could see the bright steel shining far below us in the sun on the clean, sandy bottom. By this time the tide was beginning to ebb, and the ship was swinging round to her anchor. Voices were heard faintly hallowing in the direction of the two gigs, and though this reassured us for Joyce and Hunter, who were well to the eastward, it warned our party to be off. Rudruth retreated from his place in the gallery and dropped into the boat, which we then brought round to the ship's counter to be handier for Captain Smollett. Now, men, said he. Do you hear me? There was no answer from the forecastle. It's to you. Abraham Gray, it's to you I am speaking. Still no reply. Gray, resumed Mr. Smollett a little louder. I am leaving this ship. And I order you to follow your captain. I know you are a good man at bottom, and I dare say not one of the lot of you is as bad as he makes out. I have my watch here in my hand. I give you thirty seconds to join me in. There was a pause. Come, my fine fellow, continued the captain. Don't hang so long in stays. I'm risking my life and the lives of these good gentlemen every second. There was a sudden scuffle, a sound of blows, and outburst Abraham Gray with a knife cut on the side of the cheek, and came running to the captain like a dog to the whistle. I'm with you, sir, said he. And the next moment he and the captain had dropped aboard of us, and we had shoved off and given way. We were clear out of the ship, but not yet ashore in our stockade. XXVI narrative continued by the doctor. The Jolly Boat's last trip, this fifth trip, was quite different from any of the others. In the first place, the little gallipot of a boat that we were in was gravely overloaded. Five grown men, and three of them Trelawney, Redruth, and the captain over six feet high, was already more than she was meant to carry. Add to that the powder, pork, and bread bags. The gunwale was lifting astern. Several times we shipped a little water, and my breeches and the tails of my coat were all soaking wet before we had gone a hundred yards. The captain made us trim the boat, and we got her to lie a little more evenly. All the same, we were afraid to breathe. In the second place, the ebb was now making a strong rippling current running westward through the basin and then south ard and seaward down the straits by which we had entered in the morning. Even the ripples were a danger to our overloaded craft, but the worst of it was that we were swept out of our true course and away from our proper landing place behind the point. If we let the current have its way, we should come ashore beside the gigs, where the pirates might appear at any moment. I cannot keep her head for the stockade, sir, said I to the captain. I was steering while he and Redruth, two fresh men, were at the oars. The tide keeps washing her down. Could you pull a little stronger? Not without swamping the boat, said he. You must bear up. Sir, if you please bear up until you see your gaining. I tried and found by experiment that the tide kept sweeping us westward until I had laid her head due east, or just about right angles to the way we ought to go. We'll never get ashore at this rate, said I. If it's the only course that we can lie, sir, we must even lie it, returned the captain. We must keep upstream. You see, sir, he went on, if once we dropped to leeward of the landing place, it's hard to say where we should get ashore, besides the chance of being boarded by the gigs. Whereas, the way we go the current must slacken, and then we can dodge back along the shore. The current's less a ready, sir, said the man Gray, who was sitting in the foresheets. You can ease her off a bit. Thank you, my man, said I, 
quite as if nothing had happened, for we had all quietly made up our minds to treat him like one of ourselves. Suddenly the captain spoke up again, and I thought his voice was a little changed. The gun, said he. I have thought of that, said I, for I made sure he was thinking of a bombardment of the fort. They could never get the gun ashore, and if they did, they could never haul it through the woods. Look astern, doctor, replied the captain. We had entirely forgotten the long nine, and there, to our horror, were the five rogues busy about her, getting off her jacket, as they called the stout tarpaulin cover under which she sailed. Not only that, but it flashed into my mind at the same moment that the round shot and the powder for the gun had been left behind, and a stroke with an axe would put it all into the possession of the evil ones abroad. Israel was Flint's gunner, said Gray hoarsely. At any risk, we put the boat's head direct for the landing place. By this time we had got so far out of the run of the current that we kept steerage way even at our necessarily gentle rate of rowing, and I could keep her steady for the goal. But the worst of it was that with the course I now held we turned our broadside instead of our stern to the Hispaniola and offered a target like a barn door. I could hear as well as see that brandy-faced rascal Israel Hands plumping down a round shot on the deck. Who's the best shot? Asked the captain. Mr. Trelawney, out and away, said I. Mr. Trelawney, will you please pick me off one of these men, sir? Hands, if possible, said the captain. Trelawney was as cool as steel. He looked to the priming of his gun. Now, cried the captain, easy with that gun, sir, or you'll swamp the boat. All hands stand by to trim her when he aims. The squire raised his gun, the rowing ceased, and we leaned over to the other side to keep the balance, and all was so nicely contrived that we did not ship a drop. They had the gun, by this time, slewed round upon the swivel and hands. Who was at the muzzle with the rammer was in consequence the most exposed. However, we had no luck, for just as Trelawney fired, down he stooped, the ball whistled over him, and it was one of the other four who fell. The cry he gave was echoed not only by his companions on board, but by a great number of voices from the shore. And looking in that direction, I saw the other pirates trooping out from among the trees and tumbling into their places in the boats. Here come the gigs. Sir, said I, give way, then, cried the captain. We mustn't mind if we swamp her now. If we can't get ashore, all's up. Only one of the gigs is being manned, sir, I added. The crew of the other most likely going round by shore to cut us off. They'll have a hot run, sir, returned the captain, Jack ashore, you know. It's not them I mind, it's the round shot. Carpet bowls. My lady's maid couldn't miss. Tell us, squire, when you see the match and we'll hold water. In the meanwhile, we had been making headway at a good pace for a boat so overloaded, and we had shipped but little water in the process. We were now close in, thirty or forty strokes, and we should beach her. For the ebb had already disclosed a narrow belt of sand below the clustering trees. The gig was no longer to be feared, the little point had already concealed it from our eyes. The ebb tide, which had so cruelly delayed us, was now making reparation and delaying our assailants. The one source of danger was the gun. If I durst, said the captain, I'd stop and pick off another man. But it was plain that they meant nothing should delay their shot. They had never so much as looked at their fallen comrade, though he was not dead. 
and I could see him trying to crawl away. Ready, cried the squire. Hold, cried the captain, quick as an echo. And he and Rudruth backed with a great heave that sent her stern bodily underwater. The report fell in at the same instant of time. This was the first that Jim heard. The sound of the squire's shot not having reached him. Where the ball passed, not one of us precisely knew. But I fancy it must have been over our heads and that the wind of it may have contributed to our disaster. At any rate, the boat sank by the stern, quite gently, in three feet of water, leaving the captain and myself facing each other on our feet. The other three took complete headers and came up again drenched and bubbling. So far there was no great harm. No lives were lost, and we could wade ashore in safety. But there were all our stores at the bottom, and to make things worse, only two guns out of five remained in a state for service. Mine I had snatched from my knees and held over my head, by a sort of instinct. As for the captain, he had carried his over his shoulder by a bandolier, and like a wise man, lock uppermost. The other three had gone down with the boat. To add to our concern, we heard voices already drawing near us in the woods along shore, and we had not only the danger of being cut off from the stockade in our half-crippled state, but the fear before us whether, if Hunter and Joyce were attacked by half a dozen, they would have the sense and conduct to stand firm. Hunter was steady, that we knew. Joyce was a doubtful case a pleasant, polite man for a valet and to brush one's clothes, but not entirely fitted for a man of war. With all this in our minds, we waded ashore as fast as we could, leaving behind us the poor jolly boat and a good half of all our powder and provisions. 18 Narrative Continued by the Doctor End of the first day's fighting, we made our best speed across the strip of wood that now divided us from the stockade, and at every step we took the voices of the buccaneers rang nearer. Soon we could hear their footfalls as they ran, and the cracking of the branches as they breasted across a bit of thicket. I began to see we should have a brush for it in earnest, and looked to my priming. Captain, said I, Trelawney is the dead shot. Give him your gun. His own is useless. They exchanged guns. And Trelawney, silent and cool as he had been since the beginning of the bustle, hung a moment on his heel to see that all was fit for service. At the same time, observing Gray to be unarmed, I handed him my cutlass. It did all our hearts good to see him spit in his hand, knit his brows, and make the blade sing through the air. It was plain from every line of his body that our new hand was worth his salt. Forty paces farther we came to the edge of the wood and saw the stockade in front of us. We struck the enclosure about the middle of the south side, and almost at the same time, seven mutineers job Anderson the bosun. At their head appeared in full cry at the southwestern corner. They paused as if taken aback, and before they recovered, not only the squire and I, but Hunter and Joyce from the blockhouse had time to fire. The four shots came in rather a scattering volley, but they did the business. One of the enemy actually fell, and the rest without hesitation, turned and plunged into the trees. After reloading, we walked down the outside of the palisade to see to the fallen enemy. He was stone dead shot through the heart. We began to rejoice over our good success when just at that moment a pistol cracked in the bush, a ball whistled close past my ear, and poor Tom Rudruth stumbled and fell his length on the ground. Both the squire and I returned the shot, 
but as we had nothing to aim at, it is probable we only wasted powder. Then we reloaded and turned our attention to poor Tom. The captain and Gray were already examining him, and I saw with half an eye that all was over. I believe the readiness of our return volley had scattered the mutineers once more, for we were suffered without further molestation to get the poor old gamekeeper hoisted over the stockade and carried, groaning and bleeding, into the log house. Poor old fellow. He had not uttered one word of surprise, complaint, fear, or even acquiescence from the very beginning of our troubles till now, when we had laid him down in the log house to die. He had lain like a Trojan behind his mattress in the gallery. He had followed every order silently, doggedly, and well. He was the oldest of our party by a score of years, and now sullen, old. Serviceable servant, it was he that was to die. The squire dropped down beside him on his knees and kissed his hand, crying like a child. Be I going, doctor? He asked. Tom, my man, said I. You're going home. I wish I had had a lick at them with the gun first, he replied. Tom, said the squire. Say you forgive me, won't you? Would that be respectful-like for me to you, squire?